we'll give thanks today to God for another day. Here we go. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for another day of your blessings. Today we have the opportunity to come with our leaders, our workers, who give all their time, their hard work to keep our community safe. Another year has passed since we had our last conference, but we know this year has been a difficult one. But we also know that we have been with us here each year. There's so many things we had to give up this year. But during this time, and we give you thanks, we have always had a good taste of the Lord. And although we cannot gather with fellowship with our friends, I give each other and to be with each other this year. But we offer a special thank you to all the staff for all the effort and the hard work as they continue to teach and help us to, to understand the meaning of diabetes that has been so devastating for the last few years. But we know this now, they give us the understanding of the meaning of diabetes. But we bless you. We pray that you bless each and everyone who is involved in putting these things together the next few days. As we journey together, help us to learn and to understand, but most of all to accept the wisdom and the teaching that our workers will be giving us this next few days. Bless all the speakers who will be taking part. Bless all who hear these teachings. We pray that you will continue to bless our community and all the leaders and the pandemic team, we still all, as they do their best to continue to look after us. We offer special prayer today for the Osborne family that are grieving. The <laughs> The <laughs> the Osborne family get the witch. Get the witch, you watch it, this is that she wish to all much upon him all. Get the witch, you watch it, the so any much it that is. Mina got the yak, it is just a tower, who give pay much upon chick mistake, or chicken at it to a magam, Pagosina Monan get the so any much it wish to all. That to get the magina much it, Monsieur Nato, he does the nature. Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. We dance in the Council of Anthony Abbott Health Portfolio Holder at Abbottson. 
Han har stått en bedre tann. Jeg ble vite barn om Diabetes Conference skal vi gjerne nok. Jeg spilte i panikken. Jeg skal ikke godt nær spesielt, men jeg var nesten nok til å spille gjerne og ikke noe gang. Jeg må ikke vite ut seg at jeg. Og jeg må ikke avgås finne gamle godt til jeg. Jeg har vært noe til stav, at du skal gjøre noe nok. Da spiller jeg noe om konferens, virtual konferens, skal jeg ta noe. Jeg må sitte til resten i morgen i noe. Da vil jeg gjerne mot deg om en diabetes skal jeg snakke til deg. Så jeg var spennende min, skal jeg ta meg inn an i en ny stomach. Jeg har et tema for denne diabetes konferens. Det er en journey living with diabetes. I den vakt har jeg mot deg om en jeg skal gå til hver hos hun, så jeg var spennende min diabetes skal jeg snakke til deg. Da tok jeg seg av. Og men nå har vi svinn, jeg skal gå til å gå til ansi, jeg skal gå til å ta til å gå med svinn. Så når jeg skal måne, jeg ber dette gjerne å ta noe, så jeg har jeg mitt av å gå presis. Og jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har ikke gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet. Da gir jeg meg her, og jeg har gitt seg nok, da vet jeg meg at jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet. Så jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har gitt seg mitt nok i stedet, og jeg har gitt seg mitt I'm so glad that the uh, staff have put the uh, virtual diabetes conference together to inform the community on the uh, issues surrounding diabetes. And it's so hard right now to have in-person get-togethers, but it's also good that uh, we can do this in a virtual moment. And uh, we're gonna be hearing from people that are living with diabetes. A journey living with diabetes is a theme this year. So again, thank you for taking the time to join in and listen in. Any further questions can be directed to my response at our health division office, 359-6704. Negusanin Dutlemak, stay safe and God bless you. Negusanin. Tansi, welcome to our fourth annual ADI Diabetes Conference 2021. For the first time ever, we are hosting the conference virtually and on the local NHTV channel three and on YouTube channel, Norway House Communications. So to start off the conference, I'd like to welcome the Norway House Cree Nation Health Director, Florence Duncan, to address us with her opening remarks. Welcome, Florence. Tansi, I hope that you will enjoy our fourth annual ADI Diabetes Virtual Conference, our new way of connecting with people during this world pandemic. In this virtual conference, you will be hearing from different speakers, people from our community sharing their personal experience living with diabetes. Some will be sharing their struggles, while some will be sharing their successes in managing diabetes by changing their lifestyle to become healthier. I encourage you to take this time and to listen, participate in this virtual conference. Thank you to Myra Spence, our Diabetes Coordinator, to all the speakers that have agreed to participate in this virtual conference. I wish you all well, and hopefully we can meet face-to-face -face in the near future, as this is our new normal today. Egoze, thank you. Danse, kita tamiskat nao. My name is Myra Spence. I am the Norhouse Cree Nation Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative Coordinator. I am happy to be here today to welcome you all that are listening and joining us today to be with us at our fourth annual ADI Diabetes Conference. Our theme for this year's conference is a journey living with diabetes. We will be hearing from some of our local community members who will be speaking on their own personal journeys living with diabetes type 2. They will be sharing on their struggles as well as their accomplishments. Diabetes affects us all, whether we are living with it or knowing or living with someone who is affected by it. The hopes of the ADI program by sharing the journey of our people is to learn from them as health professionals, community leaders, community members, relationship partners, family, parents, siblings, children, and friends, we can all learn. Learning the struggles one has, learning ways to cope, to support, to help, and most of all, what can we do for ourselves to prevent diabetes within our own families. Life as we know it today with a pandemic of COVID-19 virus has caused many hardships in our daily lives. 
Living with diabetes alone is a hardship and a struggle, and with this pandemic, it has affected the healthcare systems in many ways. The services we took for granted are still there. However, there are numerous changes now on how we access them and the time it takes to access them. Services have changed during these uncertain times. I am sure you all know what I'm talking about. With the ADI program and its mandate to provide diabetes awareness, prevention and programming to the community, we too are affected by the pandemic and the lockdowns that we've had in our community. We need to find innovative ways to provide our services. This conference is one way to reach out to you and hopefully we will be able to continue to reach out to you virtually. Especially want to reach out to our children, our youth and young parents. We have noticed the increase of type 2 diabetes in our youth. We as parents, grandparents need to be, to be uh, proactive in prevention of diabetes and good health. Our children are our responsibility and that includes our children's health. We all know we are what we eat and what we do is who we are. Let's do our part and make a change to be a healthier, to be healthier for ourselves and our family. Let's make changes in our eating habits. Small changes can make a difference. Start slow and create good hap habits. Physical activity is a great way to start. Involve the family. Family fun activities. Be creative. Activities can be indoor and outdoor. Make great memories. Society and media shaped us to be still, eating foods we are not accustomed to. Technology devices has taken over our children's lives, literally. When you watch TV, all you see in the commercials of our food that is not good for us, or commercials of new technology that is forever changing. Our children are forgetting how to entertain themselves without it. How many times have you sat at the supper table without anyone on a technology device and actually have a conversation at the table to talk about how we are doing today? I hear children say I am bored when they don't have their phone or their iPad, iPod, computer, TV, you know, etc. in front of them. Parents, grandparents, remember when we didn't have that? We were always finding new ways to play and be active and neighborhood children were, would always play together. We were always active. We also ate good, healthy, nutritious, wild food. Diabetes was rare, if any, in those days. We need to think back and check into what we, what we did right and to be healthy and compare it to today. I am talking about this today to remind you, be careful of the influences the world has brought us. Creator gave us the gift and ability to make our own choices and our own decisions. We all individually can do that for ourselves and be responsible for our own health and our children's health. With this, I encourage you to stay tuned, see and learn from our guests today. Please be respectful and kind as they share their personal journeys. Egosani, and please enjoy the conference. Thank you. I'm going to start the conference by sharing some information with you on how sugar works in the body. I'll be sharing some information on what is diabetes, the signs and symptoms of diabetes, and how you can get tested for type 2 diabetes. So first of all, I'm going to start by showing you a diagram of how the, how the sugar works in the body. So first of all, here's your food. It goes, your food goes into your stomach. And then once it's in your stomach, it goes into your bloodstream and it turns into sugar. Okay, so the sh the, your food turns into sugar, goes into the bloodstream. And we have an important uh, gland called the pancreas and it sits right somewhere around here in our body. And that pancreas is what produces insulin. So we need insulin to get rid of the sugar out of our body. So what it does is it'll release some insulin out of the pancreas. It'll go into the bloodstream, connect with the sugar, because you need sugar and insulin to produce energy. It'll go into your cells and it'll produce energy. 
When you don't have uh, diabetes, this is how it normally works. So now I'm gonna go into talking about what is diabetes. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is a disease that affects the pancreas and insulin production in the body. Depending on the type of uh, diabetes, this could mean that your pancreas is not able to produce insulin at all, or not able to produce enough insulin to properly control the amount of glucose in your, in your bloodstream, in your body. When you don't have the right amount of uh, insulin, your blood sugar levels can be too high or too low. So if your blood sugar levels are not well controlled, it can cause a lot of damage to the blood vessels in your body. And in time, this can result in complications, which can affect your eyesight, your kidneys, your nervous system, and your brain. I have two vials here, and one is a healthy vial. This is your bloodstream and how your blood flows. This is a person with a high blood sugar. And I'm just gonna flip them around and show you how the blood flows. So this is a person that's living with high blood sugars and this is the normal. So you can see with the, the normal blood sugar levels, the blood flows faster. And with the person that has the high blood sugars, it tends to be more thick, kind of like syrupy and it flows very slow. So that's how that works. That's how your blood flows in your bloodstream with diabetes and normal. So now when your blood, blood doesn't flow properly, that's when, you know, it affects your, it affects your body. It affects your, uh, your, your little blood vessels. It, uh, it affects your nerves in your body. The furthest to your, from your heart is your limbs, your fingertips and your toes. So when your blood is flowing slowly and not properly, when you have diabetes, it's harder for the blood flow to get to the, your further extremities, like your feet and your fingers. And when uh, it, it doesn't carry enough oxygen as well into your extremities, so the first things that get damaged is your small little blood vessels and your nerves. And we have a lot of those in our eyes as well, our kidneys, our... So that's, that's how the complications start in your body. It is important for you to know that avoiding high and low blood sugar levels can lower your risk of developing complications. So that's why it's so important for you to to keep your blood sugar levels as normal as possible. That is the number one goal for a person that's living with diabetes for that reason. It is so important to control your blood sugar levels and it is such an important part of your diabetes care, okay? So there's uh, different types of diabetes. So the first one we're gonna talk about, it's just basic information. The first one is type one. So this is, a, this is when a person's uh, insulin production in the pancreas no longer makes insulin or only produces very little. 10% of people live with di type 1 diabetes. So the next one is type 2. This is more prominent in our, in our First Nations. First, the pancreas is not producing enough insulin and insulin resistance occurs. I'm not going to go into t detail about how that works because this is just basic information, but we can provide you with that information if you, if you want to know. The glucose sugar, which is sugar, it's called glucose uh, for another term for sugar, is partly locked out of the cells and cannot be used for energy. So that's what happens like I showed you in the diagram. So it stays in the blood longer. The pancreas works harder to make more insulin to overcome the resistance. So eventually, sometimes the pancreas just stops working if it works too hard. 
When the pancreas is not able to make the extra insulin, the blood sugarizes and diagnosis of type 2 can be made. Type 2 diabetes occurs later in life, although it can occur in children and adolescents. We are now seeing a rise of this in children and adolescents. Lifestyle changes is needed for treatment of type 2 diabetes, meaning careful attention to healthy eating and physical activity. It is essential. Diabetes medication called antihyperglycemic agents are also uh, that lower blood sugar levels are needed as well at this point. So there, for example, the glimepiride and metformin are usually started. And 90% of all diabetes cases are type 2. Now we're going to go into the gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is first diagnosed and first develops during pregnancy. So this happens to women. The blood sugar levels usually return to normal following the delivery of the baby. Mothers are at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life if they don't change their lifestyle, their healthier eating and physical activity. I just wanted to share some information from Dr. Gilroy regarding the gestational diabetes. So this is uh, her quote. Uh, All women are checked for type 2 diabetes at the beginning, at the initial visit, by doing a HbA1c test. If this is negative, the GDM test timing depends on past history. If the woman has a strong history of uh, GDM, DM in previous pregnancies, they get checked at 20 weeks gestational. If this is negative, they get checked again at 28 weeks. If they have never had GDM, gestational diabetes mellitus type 2, they get checked at 28 weeks. Of course, there is also always the clinic picture and I might decide to test someone earlier for another reason. Here, the why. Type 2 diabetes is not uncommon. We know that women who have had GDM before are at higher risk for developing GDM again and will often develop it earlier in pregnancy. That is why we test at 20 weeks. It would be very rare for a woman to develop GDM prior to that point, which relates to the met metabolic and hormonal change in changes in pregnancy. For women without D diabetes type 2 and no history of uh, gestational diabetes, the most common point to develop gestational diabetes is around 28 weeks. Again, this relates to the general pregnancy changes in the body. And this information is from Dr. Nadine Gilroy. And I think that's very important information that we needed to, to bring out there for the women in our community. The next uh, thing I'm going to talk about is pre-diabetes. So pre-diabetes is when blood sugar levels are above normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes. The pancreas is not producing enough insulin to unlock the body cells to let the sugar in. So that it's already starting. So pre-diabetes has no symptoms and can only be diagnosed with a blood test. People with prediabetes have a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes and complications including cardiovascular disease. So you'll have to get checked out. There are four types of tests that the doctors will request that can be done by your doctor to determine the diagnosis of diabetes. The first one is a fasting plasma glucose. It's called FPG. You will be required to fast for eight hours and the blood test will be done at the lab. The second one is the oral glucose tolerance test. It's called OGTT. This will be done with two tests. So the first part of that test will be you'll have to fast for eight hours, then they'll take a blood test. And then the second part of that test They'll give you a drink, a glucose drink. It's uh, 75 grams of uh, a sweet drink. 
and then the, you'll wait two hours and then they'll, they'll do another blood test and that's how they can figure out if you have diabetes or not, type 2. And then the third test is called an A1C. You've probably heard of that term before. So this one is done in, in the lab and what it does is it checks three months back of how your blood sugars were. So that's the one they call A1C test. And then of course the fourth one, random plasma glucose RPG blood test. It's a blood test and they'll, they, they can pick up if you have high blood sugars and those are the four types of tests that the doctor will request if you're wanting to get tested for diabetes type 2. So the next thing on my presentation, so the doctor will get readings of your results of course and this will determine if you are pre-diabetic or if you are type 2 diabetic. There are other types of diabetes including diabetes associated with other diseases or drug use and genetically defined some forms of the disease like MODI, mature onset diabetes of the young. This is becoming more common. It used to be less common back in the day, but now because we're seeing more youth and adolescents getting diabetes at an early age, so this is another form. Back in the day, diabetes type two didn't show up in adults till they were past their 40 years of age. However, not all people with pre-diabetes will progress with uh, type 2 diabetes because lifestyle factors are in your control and, and that's why we stress that you need to make that decision to make the changes in your life to get rid of your diabetes. So what you need to do is do some healthy eating and physical activity. This can help to reduce the risk of getting diabetes type 2. There's some risk factors for diabetes. Like I said, 40 years old and up, you, still, you have to really watch how you eat and your physical activity. Like I said, we are all at risk, young and old. We have to think that way that we are all at risk. Uh, if you have a first degree relative with type two diabetes, you are at risk. If you're a member of a high-risk population, meaning Aboriginal, Hispanic, or South Asian descent, the, these people are also at risk. And because we are Aboriginal, we already have a risk. So we're all carrying one risk right off the bat because we are Aboriginal. If you had a history of gestational diabetes, you are at risk. Presence of disease and or conditions associated with diabetes, like for example, retinopathy, nephropathy, heart failure, stroke, etc. If you have conditions like that, then you are at risk. If you had a history of delivering a larger than normal infant, meaning weight wise, they say around nine pounds or over. So if you had a heavy baby, then you're, you're at risk. If you have high blood pressure, you're at risk. Usually diabetes and high blood pressure go hand in hand, but that's not always the case, but you're at risk if you have high blood pressure. Uh, being overweight, that's you're at risk for that as well. And abdominal obesity. So if you're obese and you have the, the weight right around your waist, then you're at risk, okay? So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the signs and symptoms of diabetes. Some of the signs and symptoms, if you have these, if you're being thirsty a lot, you need to drink lots of water all the time, you're always thirsty, you want something to drink. If you have to pee often, you know, you're forever running to the bathroom, uh, you're having that urge to pee all the time, that's, that's a sign. Um, the other one is gaining or losing weight. So all of a sudden you're gaining weight or all of a sudden you're really losing weight. That's a, that's a sign and symptom as well. Getting tired, like you're really drowsy, you're to the point where you're really drowsy, you're tired, you have fatigue, that's a sign. Blurred vision, 
Blurred vision is also a sign. So all of a sudden you start experiencing blurred vision. That's a sign and symptom for diabetes type 2 as well. If you have infections that don't heal, that's, that's a sign as well. If you get cuts and bruises and they heal slowly, those are all signs of uh, uh, and symptoms of diabetes. For the men, usually they'll have problems with erection. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about that, but we need to bring it out here and uh, inform the men that if you have problems with erection, there's something going on. You might, this is a sign and symptom as well. If you have tingling and numbness in the hands or feet, you have these sensations of tingly, tingliness in your hand, fingertips or your palms, your soles of your feet, your toes. If you have that, those are signs and symptoms as well. You can have none of these signs and symptoms and still have type 2 diabetes, okay? So, but these are the most common signs and symptoms for diabetes type 2. Sometimes what happens is uh, I hear some people talking about this, that they don't have the signs and symptoms. And, that, and maybe because it's uh, their body had gotten used to, to it. So number six, high blood sugar and low blood sugar signs and symptoms. So when you have high blood sugar, you will get shaky, dizzy, sweaty, you can get weak, you'll feel nervous, irritable, confused, you're always hungry, fast heartbeat, numbness, like I said, numbness and tingling, tingling in, in, uh, in your body as well as your tongue and your lips. So that's when your sugar is, uh, is too, too low or too high. Signs are uh, you th you're thirsty, you're tired, you pee more often. Those are some of the signs and symptoms. And I'll get into detail about the high and the low, the difference between the high and the low. So the high blood sugar, the signs are the extreme tiredness, the dry mouth. You'll have a dry mouth, you'll be thirsty as well extreme thirst, like I said, frequent urge to urinate, that means to pee, and drowsiness, that's very tired all the time, okay? So that's when you have high blood sugar, when you're walking around with high blood sugar. And then you can experience low blood sugars as well. So the low blood sugar signs and symptoms, these are important to know so that you can check your blood sugar or get help. You'll have experienced mood changes. You'll sometimes you'll feel shaky and really trembly. You'll have uh, you'll get paleness in the face uh, with some even some sweating. Uh, you'll feel lightheaded, dizzy. You'll have that blurred vision. You can experience headaches with this, and then that extreme tiredness. And also you'll feel really hungry that you need to get food inside you right away. So that's when you're experiencing low blood sugars. These are important to know because this can be very dangerous. If your blood sugar drops, you can go into what they call a diabetic coma if, it's, if, it, if you don't get help right away or if you don't get sugar in your body right away. And with the high blood sugars, you also need help because that's dangerous as well. Children and teens may have no symptoms at all. However, there's factors. One is uh, obesity. So if, you're, if your child is uh, obese, especially around the mid-waist area, and if they're inactive, meaning that they're not moving around, they're sitting still too much, they can, that's a, a risk as well and a factor. If they have a family history of type 2 diabetes, meaning the parents or the siblings or the grandparents have it, you know, that's, that's also a factor. And like I said, being Aboriginal, we're all, all at risk. I want to talk a little bit about this Anconthosis nicocrans, it's called. And this is a darkening, velvety skin that can appear around the neck area, 
uh, under the armpits, uh, sometimes on the elbows or on the knuckles, on the knees. It's on the skin, it's thick, it's dark, it's velvety, and it comes in like patches. And like I said, that's where it shows on those areas. So those are, uh, those are signs of uh, diabetes. And this can show up on children, on youth, adolescents, and also in adults. And that's the end of my presentation. So here are my references. I've gotten this information from the CDA and Novlin Care with the high and low blood sugars. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you very much. And this is just an overview of uh, what is diabetes, the signs and symptoms, and how you can get tested. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Nagasani. Hello, my name is Daryl Oman. I'm here to speak to you uh, for the Diabetes Conference. I wanted to come speak for our kids, the youth. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was 10. I was really small and I didn't know what, what it was. I just knew my mom was on needles for it and I said, do I have to be on needles too? And today I am. I'm on two different insulins, long acting, um, short acting. I have, I'm on a bubble pack, this. But I wanted to come speak to the kids so that they so that they don't have to be on any of this. I also um, got diagnosed with glaucoma in 2013. I lost my eyesight. It's been hard, really hard, but you adjust eventually. And my life is, you know, check your sugar every morning, take your eye drops, do your insulin try to find some exercise to do. Like anything can help you, cleaning up, anything to get your heart going. Um, but my main reason here is to speak for our youth because there's a lot of kids being diagnosed with, diabe with diabetes and we can prevent it. It's very preventable. Um, our kids are our future, so they need to know this too. You know, if you wanna, if you don't wanna be on these every day, this is constantly three, four times a day checking my sugar, three times a day with insulin, my eye drops twice a day, my pills are bedtime, morning and bedtime. Um, the last. 25 years, um, I lived with diabetes and I didn't, it didn't occur to me till now that it's actually been 25 years since I had this. It's not easy living like this. Can we stop for a minute? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I wanted to mention the diabetes team, Dr. Dean and Dr. Sellers. They looked after me from when I was 10 all the way till I was 18. They were a good support, a good help. They taught us what's good for you, what's not good for you, what can happen if you don't look after your diabetes, like going to blindness, loss of limbs, multiple surgeries um they helped guide me till i went to dr ludwig after i turned 18 and now she's looking after me for the last 11 years and she's practically family to me now because she helped me go through two pregnancies um diabetes and pregnancy is also hard um, my first pregnancy was 
16 years ago and the risks were high for me because um, I already had diabetes eight years and they said I shouldn't have any kids because either me, the baby, or both of us could, could die. The first pregnancy, I hemorrhaged and I almost lost my life. And then I got pregnant with my five-year-old 10 years later and she almost, we almost lost her. She would have been a stillborn. She, they call it sleepy baby. My doctor called it sleepy baby from when you have so much insulin, you're injecting so much insulin that your baby can slip into a coma, but they took her out in time and my doctor calls her her miracle baby because she made it. I made it to 35 weeks. It was the hardest 35 weeks ever to carry a baby and have diabetes. I was sick every day. My first pregnancy was okay until I had her and I hemorrhaged. Um, but the second pregnancy is, was really hard. I couldn't, I couldn't eat. All I did was sleep and I was so, so sick. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. It felt like I was dying, but it was just the effects of diabetes and pregnancy. My baby is five years old today and my other one is 16. They say when you're diabetic, your baby is twice the size of a normal baby and it's true. My daughter is twice the size of all the kids in her class. <laughs> she's, she's the giant in her class from me being a diabetic mother now my kids are in a project. I put them in a project where they get tested for diabetes every three months. I prefer them to be in this because I was diabetic so young and I don't want them to go through what I had to go through. I was put on insulin when I was 12 when my sugars were going out of control already. When I was young, when I first got it, I didn't know what it was and nobody asked me how I felt like there's a psychological barrier that follows you till you're an adult thinking like am I normal like I, I'll never be normal again how come I can't eat what the other kids are eating or do what they're doing like you know because I had to be careful so after probably my teen years, I started not caring. I started not taking my meds and I started drinking, doing drugs and got into all this stuff that teenagers do. And I stopped taking all my meds. And then after, after a while, I started getting sick, more and more sick. and. After a while, my eyesight went. I, when I lost my eyesight, I was actually able to go through my pregnancy with my, my blindness and my diabetes. Eventually, you adjust to everything. Um, I wanted to mention my doctor, Dr. Ludwig. She was a really good support. She. She always looks after my health. She, she does everything in her power to try to get me better and to keep me going, to keep me healthy. Living with this for 25 years, it didn't even seem like 25 years. It just felt like it was yesterday I had it, but to this day now, I check my sugar, it's supposed to be three to four times a day. Sometimes I forget. <laughs> Sometimes you just get tired of it, but you know, you still have to keep going. I keep going for my kids. I want eye drops, different eye drops. One, um, 
This one here, Combi Gun, I'm on it for life. And then these two, they're gonna keep me on these. And my pills change every once in a while, like depending if my iron goes low or if something's missing, like my electrolytes, they add something. That's a lot of pills, but they keep me going. I got Ramapril to protect my kidneys. My kidneys are okay right now. They're, they're still functioning. Um, I can still get around and do stuff. It's just like walking in a steamy shower all the time, but you can't see anyone, but you can hear them. And this is what I want the kids to avoid is Losing their eyesight, you can lose it young too if you don't look after yourselves. And I know there's a lot of kids becoming diabetic. When I was maybe 12, I seen this mother with this tiny little baby just learning to walk and that mom was like, it's time to take your medicine. And this was before when they had the long orange syringes. That little baby just, you know, gave his mom his leg, got his poke and just went on his normal, you know, whatever he was doing, playing. And he was born with diabetes and his pancreas was not making insulin at all. So, that's why they wanted me to be very careful when I was pregnant with my girls because when you're when you have diabetes and you have a baby there's a chance for your baby to to actually become diabetic or be born with diabetes so far the last um, the last year was kind of hard with this uh, quarantine thing to try keep the girls healthy because we're just home, you know, we're just staying home. We're trying different ways to try and lose weight and work our way in the home so that, you know, because we usually went for walks every day and now we don't even, we can't even. There's too many dogs around. But we had a, a daily walk all the time down Omens Point Road and back every day, at least twice a day. But now we're just incorporating different ways to keep healthy. Um, I, ha I, I had a 60, 40 chance of getting diabetes. The doctor told my mom when she was pregnant. They said I could have it young or I could get it when I was 40, but the case was I got it when I was 10. It was my 10th birthday. I remember we had a birthday party and we were munching out and we were eating cake and everything. And we went to go play outside and that night I couldn't pee at all. Like it hurt, it hurt so bad. I couldn't, I couldn't use the washroom so my mom took me in and they had to force me to, to use the washroom. And that next day we got a recall. We left maybe 12 o'clock at night. Uh, my mom took me in. And I remember the next day them calling saying, you should bring your daughter and we have something to tell you. Something showed up and my mom said, okay. We'll be right there. So we went and the doctor said, oh, your daughter is diabetic. I remember that day like yesterday. It still plays in my head. It still comes to my mind every so often. But in a way I see it now today as a gift to let others know, you know, you can beat this, you can, you can beat the battle and you can fight diabetes, you can keep it out of your home, just stay healthy and 
live a healthy life. And my mom cried because she knew she knew what it was about because she had it when she was 17. So she's actually a big, big part of my life, like keeping me going and telling me, you know, stay healthy for your girls. You got to do this for your girls. I feel for the kids because when I was young, I didn't like this. I didn't want this. And I say that to my girls every day. If you don't want to be like mom, if you don't want to do any of this, stay healthy. You know, eat healthy food. And my older one is getting there. Like she's really good at keeping us healthy, telling me what's wrong and what's what's okay to eat, what's not healthy, and what I shouldn't be buying. And you know, mom cut down on this and that. Like okay, I'm just trying to keep them in the right direction to keep going, you know, live a healthy lifestyle and go to school and, you know, tell tell your friends, you know, my mom's blind from diabetes. You should look after yourselves, you know. And I keep telling my friends that too, you know, take care of yourselves. You don't want to live like this. You don't want to, you don't want to not have your sight and lose those moments like that your kids show you. Like, it's kind of harder for me because my girl's like, oh, look, mommy, and you know, like, oh, okay. Like, I just try hard to see what she's showing me. And if you don't want to live like that, you know, stay healthy. I think I inherited diabetes from all four grandparents, my parents, and then to me. My brother's not diabetic, they said. He might get it in his 40s um, if he doesn't look after himself too. Um, my kids have a chance, but I'm looking after them really good for it. And I'm glad the diabetes team is still looking after them and checking on me. It makes me feel like there's somebody there for me. It can happen to anyone. It's just diabetes doesn't care. It just, it just strikes like that. And it stays. This is for life. I have two ophthalmologists in Winnipeg that are looking after my eyes right now. They're one of the top, top ophthalmologists in Canada, but they said that that's it for my eyes, you know, it's it's all they can do because I let my diabetes go so out of control that it affected my eyes and they can't reverse it. But other things I have a chance of reversing and like I'm trying. It's hard, yes, it's hard, it's hard to live like this and um yeah, to the kids, like, if you don't want to check your sugar all the time, if you don't want to take insulin, if you don't want to take pills and you're young and you're diabetic, if you've just been diagnosed, take good care of it. It's, it's hard. I've been sick. I've had 16 surgeries so far. Nine of those were for my eyes. Um, the rest were for like uh, my gallbladder, my appendix. Um, I've had a belly button hernia surgery. Like any surgery, you like I've I've had it. I've had two C sections because it was too risky for me to give natural birth. Well, both my girls were emergency C sections, so. Obviously there it shows you how dangerous it is to be pregnant and have diabetes. Um, I've lost a lot of friends to sicknesses, you know, my, some of my friends that are becoming diabetic, you know, I tell them, take care of it. Don't, don't let it, don't let it take your life like it did mine. I didn't listen 
to their doctors when they said, you know, you can go blind if you don't stop this and that, or if you keep drinking drinks, if you keep eating junk food, like I just, I was rebellious. I didn't care. I just did what I wanted to do until that one day my sugar went up to 32. It felt like I was dying, literally dying, and I had to get um, my baby's dad to put. And then it came down to 16, and I felt a little better, and I was like, give me a little more, and I was able to sit up, and I avoided going to the hospital because I knew, I knew then I would be in trouble by the doctor, and when I did go, it was too late. My eyes were already, were already affected, and my sight went. Got medevac to Winnipeg, and had so many surgeries after that, lasers, and it hurts. It really hurts to have those eye surgeries. My first eye surgery, I literally cried for my mom. It was so, so painful, and I don't want people to go through that. It was like a ax was lodged into my face. I couldn't, the nurse had to keep pulling my hand down. Like, no, it hurts. And that's why I'm here to speak so that you guys don't have to go through this. That you guys will live a healthy life and think about it. Um, I'm 35. I made it with two kids. I graduated three times to become an early childhood educator because kids Kids were my my passion to work with them, and now I want to work with kids in diabetes, so that kids can know, you know, stay healthy, or this can happen to you. Especially the little ones, the little ones now, like you see them at the mall, always ordering KFC every day at the mall, and like drinking drinks. Like we should be telling them, you know, eat fruit eat vegetables, take a sandwich, you know, all that stuff is going to affect you the way it affected me. Like, um, with greasy foods, I had to get my gallbladder removed and my appendix bursted, well, almost bursted and I got sent out. I've been medevac so many times living with this diabetes and every day is a different day, a different struggle, a different sickness, a different awful feeling. Some days are good, some days are bad. And you know, I I get I go to the hospital so many times for antibiotics and my eye pressure is going up and multiple things all the time and I just want you guys to be healthy and see my life as an example of um, how diabetes can be if you don't take care of it. I didn't take care of it for years, but now I take care of it because I have to, if I want to live, if I want to keep going, I look at my kids every day like, okay, I got to do this for them. I got to get out of bed. I got to, I gotta keep being a mom. I gotta keep doing what I was put here for. And I was praying maybe September, like, God, I wanna write a book. I wanna write a book for kids to let them know, you know, keep healthy. Don't let diabetes control your life or don't don't get diabetes and after a while I got a call from Myra asking me to speak and I said yes I will because I need to let everyone know how it is living living with diabetes and glaucoma and what are the risks you know my dad had a 
diabetes and severe heart disease and you know we recently lost him and it does affect you psychologically too like from having diabetes so long at first i thought maybe this is punishment or did i do something wrong like did i eat too much junk i keep asking myself but in a way i see it as um a guidance to help others too maybe there's others going through the same thing as me or others just becoming diabetic and they need to know you know need to know how to deal with it i wasn't asked how i felt ever and then that kind of affected me growing up cuz i was careless and rebellious but today i take my meds i check my sugar i try to be healthier than i did what did the last 10 years you know 10 years back i was really bad like that was probably about the time i lost my eyesight was when i didn't care i didn't care anymore i didn't like it i didn't like living with it and then when my eyesight went i was like oh wow this is what the doctors were trying to prevent and i didn't listen but now i want to be a word you know a, a guidance for the kids to stay healthy this is my fast acting insulin it works in 2 hours um depending on your activity and what you're doing i guess um when i do a lot of housework and that my sugar's drop and it's scary it's like a a blackout feeling and my 5 year old already knows what to do to come you know bring me something to drink or something sweet to eat like oh mommy sugar's going down and she'll be like okay i'll get this but the the feeling i get when it's low is um it's like a blackout like everything starts going black and get really dizzy and you feel like you're just going to fall a faint feeling and when my sugars are high i can tell when i start feeling nauseous and i get confused and i feel really sick like i just lay there and if i don't have it for more than 2 days there are times when i didn't have my insulin because i forgot to call it in or i called it in too late and then have to wait till the next the next following monday to get it and there are times when i do when it's high i do get really sick it's just like a heavy nauseous feeling where you can't move and i end up throwing up cuz i guess the, sh- the sugar is too much cuz my body's so used to having that needle i need that needle every day three times a day like my body starts telling me you know it's high go take your insulin like you you don't feel good go go take a go take one shot of your humulog and you'll be okay and after i take it i wait maybe an hour later i'll start coming back like okay i feel better and i get a wicked headache when it's high and i'm just really fatigued like i don't want to do nothing i just Sometimes I want to fall asleep but I'm so sick and I can't. And I just, you know, have to drink a lot of water if I don't have that insulin or try to do something, you know, mopping, anything, anything I can do to bring it down. Like water helps a lot in walking, but you have to do a lot of walking to bring it down from when it's high. I've had highs and lows like yo-yo dieting and the the lows like you get shaky and disoriented and my kids know already how 
how to react when I'm feeling like this. I taught them, you know, if mom's not feeling good, call the ambulance or, you know, run to nannies if anything ever happens. Like my kids know what to do already and they know how to inject my insulin. They know how to check my sugar for me if I can't. Uh, checking sugars is hard. It's hard on the hands. After a while, you have to keep switching fingers. Sometimes I feel like I'm out of blood because I can't, <laughs> I can't squeeze the blood out when you know, some days are different and some days it'll gush. It's a different, a different thing every day, but this is my life every day. Taking needles, you know, checking my sugar, taking my pills. Sometimes I forget. It's hard. It's it's hard being a diabetic, but you get used to it. And that's what I don't want for you people is to, to be used to this lifestyle. Like some days I don't want to get out of bed. It's, it's draining, but you know, you still got to live your life to the fullest. And I do my best every day to try be here for my kids and look after my health and look after everything, you know, look after my mom, look after my, my family. Because we don't want our kids getting diabetes, so we're, we're looking after them really good. Oh, thank you for listening. Um, I just came to be a voice for our kids and hope all of you um, take care of yourselves, you know, live a healthy lifestyle. In the end, it's going to benefit for everything. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Aiden Hart and um, I'm 16 years old and I'm here to tell you about my journey with diabetes. Um, it started about two, three years ago, I, if I remember around the first occurrences. Um, I was showing symptoms of di diabetes. I was um, f uh, very thirsty all the time. I was always drinking water. I was using the bathroom like all the time. And I was always tired, but I just kind of, you know, brushed it off and just thought it was nothing. Um, even my own family were kind of like, hey, maybe you have diabetes, but I always just avoided the subject whenever I could. So after a while, about 2019, I was going to school and I was in my counselor's office and then I was talking to him and I was like, hey, I should probably get some antidepressants because I felt like um, at the time I was really depressed. And, you know, I just thought that maybe they could work. So I made the appointment and it was set for December 2nd, I do believe. And mm, I go to the appointment and uh, before the appointment, actually, I the thought of di diabetes and having it was in the back of my head, like all the time for some strange reason. And I didn't know, like, I was like, why am I always thinking about this? Like, I, I'm fine, I was telling myself. And I feel like that was my body telling me that that was a, it was time to go check get it checked out because of the fact that I was really really sick, like internally. But I didn't know, and it could have gotten worse because it was really really bad. Um, so I go to the hospital and I'm in the waiting room, and then they call me into the treatment room, and the nurse is there, and she's like, "What are you here for?" And I finally mustered up the courage to say, I want to get checked out for diabetes. And she's like, okay, bring me your finger. So she pricked my finger and she took my sugars and my levels were around 24.5, if I remember, they were really high. And then she's like, yeah, you have diabetes. <laughs> um, being told that like right off the hop, I was very, um, I was in disbelief. Honestly, I was scared. And I didn't understand what that meant. Obviously, I knew 24.5 was bad. And I just, I, I didn't want to believe her. Because I was just like, you can't, like, you can't do that. You're just a nurse. Like, I need the test done, I was thinking in my head. I was just, I 
was shocked almost. So um, I cried. <laughs> I sat in the I sat in the treatment room and I cried for a bit because I I didn't want to hear it, and I was avoiding it for so long. And finally, it they you know it, it came uh, to life. So. Finally, once I calmed down, they gave me tissues and, you know, they kind of reassured me like, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. So I go to the treatment room and I sat there, not the treatment room, the waiting room. <laughs> I sat in the waiting room and I looked up and I was praying, hoping like, okay, it can't be like, maybe it's just a mistake. Maybe it's just because I had a lot of sugar today. And maybe that's why my levels were so high. I didn't understand how diabetes worked at the time. So it was kind of um, like, I, I didn't understand. So I just thought, you know what? I won't believe it until I get the like the true results from like, um, you know, the test from the doctor. So I sat in the waiting room like I was trying to not cry <laughs> because I was really like, mm -hmm, like I don't know. Um, and I was texting my friend and he was kind of there like telling me it's going to be okay. Like you're going to be fine. Like, and um, I didn't like, it wasn't really helpful. Like, he was doing his best, but at the same time, it was just like, I didn't, like, want to hear it from anyone. I just wanted to hear it from the doctors telling me if I have it or not. I go into the doctor's office and they're like, okay, so what? this is what we're going to do. We're going to get you to do your blood work. And um, they gave me the, prescri uh, the prescription for um, antidepressants, because that's what I was there for originally. <laughs> and I didn't want to take uh, my my blood work done because I really, really don't like needles. I remember I had surgery on my hip and uh, three nurses had to hold me down when they had to get my <laughs> blood work done. So I, I'm, not a fa I'm not very fond of needles. Uh, they told me that the lab was already uh, closed for the night because it was like five o'clock at that point. So I was like, oh, I got to do it tomorrow. So um, the doctor let me on my way. I forgot who it was. But I think it was a girl, but she let me on my way and then I called for my ride and I was just quiet the entire time going uh, home. I was really like, I was still in disbelief and I didn't like, I was scared. So um, I got my uncle to drop me off at my auntie's house because my granny was there watching my cousin. So I walk in the house and I, t I go to my granny and I start crying and I'm like, I think I have diabetes and she's like, oh. And then, she started telling me the story about how my uncle found out that he had diabetes because my uncle does have diabetes. And um, she told me like, you know, like, it's going to be OK. You're going to be all right. Like a lot of people told me that, like, I'll be fine. Like, but at the time, I felt like it was the end of the world. And I was like, I felt like my whole world, like, just crumbled down that that minute that that, that nurse told me that I was diabetic. <laughs> I didn't want to believe it. I, I really didn't. Because I was like, there, there's no way I can't be. So um, after I had that talk with my granny, I went home and I, I was very depressed. I was, I felt like I was at my lowest, and I just, my family noticed. They took notice like right away that I was very quiet and my, and I wasn't like, very, uh, like happy like I usually was. They knew that something was up, and like they knew obviously. Mm, my dad was, I think he was home, or no, 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 he was at work at the time. He works in Jempeg. And um, he was just like, you know, telling me like, oh, I'm so sorry, like, you're gonna be okay. A lot of people told me that. <laughs> um, so I was on a call. I decided to call my friend and um, I talked to him for hours and I, I cried, like, because I cried on the phone for hours with him and then I was I just I honestly wanted to take my life. I was thinking of it. Um, but I knew I couldn't do that and I knew that it, it would it would hurt my family and that's just not something I I want to do to my family. So in the end, he managed to make me laugh. He took he cracked he didn't mean to crack a joke, but he was trying to comfort me and he asked me if I wanted a Reese's pieces. <laughs> And I said, I can't have Reese's Pieces. <laughs> and um, that made me laugh. And now, like, to this day, we have that inside joke of whenever I go over to his place, I always get him Reese's Pieces. <laughs> um, that was um, late, yeah, early December. 
that happened where I first initially was told that I, I was diabetic, but I didn't want to believe it. I didn't, I wanted to hear like the act, like a doctor and the test. So for the next two weeks while I was waiting or a week, I can't exactly remember the date, but for the past next two weeks or a week, I was watching what I ate. I was, I have a sweet tooth and I loved having like slushes and like pastries. So I never had any of those. And I was eating very good, like I was having like porridge in the morning and I wasn't eating bread. Like I was very being very, very cautious of what I ate. Same thing, um, I didn't want to eat, but my uncle told me that I, that would make it worse. So I just ate in very, very small portions. And I did sort of starve myself those during that time. And, you know, um, I kept on like, I, I don't know, I was just still in denial that I wasn't diabetic. Um, it came to, I was talking to my dad in the kitchen and I asked him, I was like, there's no way I can have diabetes. And I was in denial a lot, like during that time, I just, I didn't want to believe it. And I talked to my dad in the kitchen and he's, and he told me, he's like, you're, you know, like you're too young, you're going to be okay. Like, um, you know, it's just probably just, you know, something that happened. Maybe it was just something that you ate and your sugars were really, really high. And I believed it. Like I believed him. He was, you know, he was my dad. I look up to him. So, you know, he was comforting me and I liked it because, you know, like I felt like, you know what, it's going to be okay. I'll be fine. <clears throat> and the, t the day came where I had to go to the hospital and they told me that they would phone me when they got the results back. And I didn't get any phone call for a while until they phoned and said that I had an appointment. And I genuinely thought that I didn't have diabetes because I thought, oh, they would phone and tell me, but I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> so I didn't think that I had diabetes. I thought I was in the clear. And, um, so we go to the hospital. My dad asked my nanny to go with me and I didn't, I thought that was kind of weird at the time. And I was like, oh, I don't know why granny needs to come with me, but I just let her come with me as, you know, whatever. And, um, so she did. And we both walk into the, into the doctor's room and, uh, he walked in and I felt my body tense up. Like I, I knew that there was bad news coming, but I just, I didn't want to believe it. And he sat down and then he had his papers in his hand and he's like, Aiden, um, you have type two diabetes. <laughs> and when I heard that, I, I cried. I, I, I was sobbing. <laughs> I was, I didn't want to hear it. I, I, I didn't want to believe it, but it, and at the time, like it just, it felt like the world was going really, really slow. Like time was going so slow. Um, I was, I, I was in shock. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he let me calm down and then he started going into details about like what happened and like like why I was diabetic and um you know like um what kind of medication we needed to start to go on and um this and that so I got on insulin right off the hop. Usually for type 2, you'd, a lot of people don't really go on insulin because it's not as bad as type 1. But um, it was very bad, my levels, because they were just sky high. Um, so they had got me on insulin and metformin. So I was taking like 10 units of insulin at first. and. After the appointment, I calmed down a little bit. Uh, I was sniffling here and there. Um, and we got home and my granny phoned my dad and um, I told my dad and he started crying. And he told me that's why I wanted your granny to go with you because I know that you're diabetic. And then I, I looking back at it now, I, I, I'm really happy that my dad did that for me, that he kept me calm during those two weeks or a week. Um, because I was scared and I felt really alone. Even though I had the support of my friends and family, I felt very alone because I didn't know anyone my age who had diabetes. I didn't know any youth for that matter who had diabetes. So I felt very like isolated and I didn't know who to talk to about it because I would want to talk to someone who would have the same experiences as me. And the only people I know who had diabetes were, you know, adults. <laughs> and I was honestly embarrassed at the time. 
Um, Because I was thinking, well, of course, and I was thinking that people would think of me like, oh, of course she would have diabetes, you know, because I have been overweight my entire life. Um, It's just kind of how I, that's kind of how I grew up. And um, I was always a very chubby girl. (laughs) So I was worried about how people would think of me. So I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone that I wasn't, the people really I only told was my best friend and my closest um, best, best friends. <laughs> um, so after that, um, we went to Winnipeg, if I remember. We did go to Winnipeg, and it was the 2nd of January of 2020, and it was at like 10, 9, 10 in the morning, and um, they checked my weight, and I was very, very lighter than I was and I noticed that I did lose a bunch of weight and at the time I I liked my figure I liked the way I looked um I was still overweight but I did have like the figure that I did I did like the way I looked at the time um so at during the time when I was sick I did like you know the way I looked I didn't like the way I felt to say per se but I did like the way I looked Um, So they got me on this different type of insulin. They gave me a pretty, it was a pink pen. It was like metal almost, and I really liked it. I got to customize it. And they gave me just a bunch of stuff and told me a lot about diabetes and how it worked. And I I learned a lot (laughs) from that day. And um, to this day, I educate a lot of people about like um, if they... um, about diabetes because a lot of them don't understand they're like well how does it work like how did you get it and i explained to them about how the pancreas and like you know with type 2 the pancreas still kind of works but it it needs a little bit of help and so that's why some people take metformin and um i i do i do like telling people about it just to kind of put them into awareness that anyone can get it and i thought that um only adults can get it and I thought that I couldn't get it, but anyone can get it. Anything's possible. <laughs> so, um, it's been about a year now since I've I've gotten it, and honestly, um, I have gained a bunch of weight since. But I do like to say Corona too. <laughs> um, and honestly, it's I do not wish for anyone like to have diabetes. It's it's not fun. It's it's not a good. How do I say this? An, not an illness. I could say it's an illness. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's something that's very. You feel like you're being, like uh, for me, anyways. I feel like I'm not as. I don't have that freedom like I did before. Before I didn't have it, because I always have to constantly worry about my sugars, and I don't like to eat pastries or anything like I did before, and. I do have to bring my medication along with me and I always have to check the time of when I have to take my insulin. And it's, it, it does feel like it's very, um, like, uh, what's the word? <laughs> like trapping? I wouldn't say trapping, but y- you get the point. Um, you know, I have met, like, one girl and she is, a, she is actually a close friend of mine now. I didn't know that she had diabetes and she told me she's like yeah I got diagnosed like a few months ago and I didn't feel as alone and she was going through some struggles with taking her insulin uh, I do believe she takes insulin as well and um, I told her like all the procedures like just you know pinch your tummy and put it in and you know um, the thing with needles I was very scared about insulin because I knew I had to take needles and I hate needles um, so the first few times I um, <laughs> had my insulin my family did it for me. <laughs> um, they would uh, poke me in the thigh and then they would do it because I couldn't do it myself. I just I couldn't bring myself to do it for some reason. Um, but January 18, 2020, I took my insulin by myself for the first time. And I've been doing it since. I, I'm, I'm good at it. Like I, I do it like uh, needles aren't a big problem for me anymore now since I do it every day. Mm. And... Um, it's it's um uh, not it's not fun <laughs> i'll tell you that it's not fun and it's 
you should really watch what you do and what you eat. And I was at high risk and I ignored, I ignored the symptoms for so, so long. And I could have like, if I had waited any longer, I could have, you know, had serious complications. And I had a feeling that that was my body when I had to go to that appointment. That was my body telling me, look, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go check it out. Cause it could have been worse. Um, they had a little chart of how my glucose levels were. Um, and my levels were like over the chart. Like my, um, it was like, I was at like 20. My, my, um, my sugar levels, they were at 20. And the chart only went up to like 10, I believe. It was really, really high. Um, but back in like last year, I had another follow-up and they told me that my sugar levels were around 7. And 7.5 and I got them back to normal and I was like, oh, hey. Okay. <laughs> um, so now I am eating a lot healthier. I am going to the gym now that it's open and um, I'm trying to, you know, tell and educate people about my story and that it can happen to anyone. And, you know, don't avoid your health. Don't push, brush it away and act like it's nothing. Because it can, it can be very serious in the end and it's something you only have one life and you should treat it as, um, you know, you should treat it as such, you know. Um, you gotta live your life the best way you can and just, um, and for those like youth who do have diabetes, you aren't alone. Um, I'm just glad I'm out here talking about it because I feel like this would be really good at the time when I found out because I didn't know anyone who was diabetic at my age and I just feel like um, it's if you have it it's okay like um, if anything I'm here for you and I'm sure a lot of people in your community are and um, you it's not embarrassing it's it's normal almost <laughs> a lot of it's more common than you think it is honestly um and um that's really all i have to say <laughs> um thank you for having me today i don't know what else to say <laughs> Well, next on our agenda, we're gonna, since we've been sitting so long, we're going to have a little exercise break and I'd like to welcome Leslie McKay. He works at Jordan Principal as a land-based coordinator and I'd like you to join him in a little bit of exercise just to get your blood flowing and because uh, we've been sitting so long. So I'd like to welcome Leslie McKay. Hello guys, hope you're all enjoying the, the ADI conference so far. Uh, my name is Leslie McKay. I'm a uh, land-based coordinator for Georgia's Principal. I'm uh, just going to go through some uh, blood flowing exercises just to get the blood flowing. So you've been sitting for about quite some time. So let's get the blood flowing. Uh, just put your arms over your shoulders and get up. Do that a couple times. Do about three to five reps. Three to five reps is fine. And if you're not able to, you can just grab the railings and just lift yourself up three to five times. And then we're gonna rotate our arms clockwise. Just do small circles and go wider. Next one, the same thing, counterclockwise. Small circles and go wider. And just slap your back. Just get that blood flowing, that's all. All right, you should be good going for the next presentations. Hi, my name is uh, Roy Falster. That's my English name. My spirit name is All Eagles Coming. Um, I'm 46 years old. I'm a member of the Nori House Cree Nation and I've been living with diabetes for numerous years now. Um, I have a predisposition to diabetes. Um, 
my it runs in the family on both sides of the family my mum's family has it my dad's family has it so that made me more vulnerable to getting it and I got it um, I've lived with it for many years now I and it almost took over my life I was taking up to 10 pills a day I would take five in the morning and then five in the evening um, when I first got diagnosed I hid it from everyone the only people that knew about it were my doctor and me and I hid it for about a good year and I was in denial about it I didn't I took the pills but I continued to eat unhealthy I continued to be inactive um, and then I went for a follow-up with the doctor but nothing in my habits had changed so um, she had to increase my medication she doubled my doses for the medication I was taking and then it was in that moment in the doctor's office sitting in that chair that I realized that I needed to make a change otherwise I would I would lose myself to diabetes and I know this because I've lost loved ones to diabetes I've had um, aunties that passed away because of it I've had cousins who've passed away because of it um, and I knew I had to do something about it I've lost family and friends I know people who are my age or younger who have lost fingers and they've lost toes as well as limbs to diabetes I know people who have to go on dialysis because of diabetes I didn't want to lose my fingers or my toes I didn't want to lose my hands or my feet to diabetes I didn't want to lose my legs to diabetes I didn't want to lose time to diabetes sitting in a dialysis chair for hours and hours at a time above all I didn't want to lose my life to diabetes at one point in my life I was 340 pounds I had sleep apnea I had difficulty living walking breathing moving simple tasks in life were really hard for me to do in the past I've tried to just focus on my physical health I would try different diets I would try all kinds of things and nothing really helped um, I finally realized that I needed to work on my whole being I needed to uh, focus on my physical health my spiritual health my mental health and my emotional health I began my healing and wellness journey several years ago I began eating right getting active dealing with my feelings about myself and feeding my spirit I started with simple things like eliminating bad foods one time I eliminated chips and then I eliminated Pepsi because everybody likes Pepsi um, I eliminated that and then I went to diet Pepsi but that you know give and take um, I began walking the track the Hubert Hart wellness track I used to do one mile or one lap and I would I'd be pouring sweat and I'd be huffing and puffing doing that just one lap I began to recognize my negative emotions and figure out why I was feeling them I began going to ceremony to learn about our way of life and who I am as an indigenous person and each time that something got easier I uh, I would eliminate something else I would eliminate another bad food I would add another lap at the track and I'd speak to a friend or a family member about how I was feeling um, I would attend another ceremony and I'd learn more I always challenged myself to change and that change came slowly and with some really really hard work uh, I began losing weight I felt better about my physical appearance I felt good inside um, I had more positive emotions and the doctor began decreasing my medication slowly and then finally we eliminated some medications altogether I went from 10 pills a day to 2 pills a day or no that's four pills a day I would take two in the morning I currently now I take two in the morning and I take two in the evening and of those two pills I take in the morning and in the evening just one is to help with the diabetes 
Um, my blood sugars when I first started my journey became normal. Uh, my A1Cs became normal. The doctor told me that I had basically reversed my diabetes and that all my tests showed that I had the A1Cs and the blood, sugar, blood sugars of a non-diabetic. I was so happy. Then COVID hit. COVID came and just turned our world upside down. I had many emotions about COVID when it first, when we first started hearing about it. I was like, nah, it's over there. It's on the other side of the world. And then it came closer, it came closer to Canada. And then I started thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Like, what's going to happen? And the changes already started happening with uh, restrictions and all that. And it, it, it got even closer and then I became scared of it. I was defeated by it. I was isolated by it. And when finally, when COVID finally got to Nori House, I was terrified. I was scared for my mom and my family. I was scared for our community. COVID took my whole, it turned my life upside down. It took my uh, social circle away. Um, it took away ceremony, which took a toll on my spiritual well-being. Uh, it took away the kids at work at the school that I work at and what's a school without kids? Um, and then eventually it just took my work away altogether. Like we had to stay home because we went on lockdown. Um, it had me locked in my home and it had me locked in my community. It took one of the coping mechanisms that I used to help feed and be well all, to, all around. And that was the gym. When they closed the gym, I was, I, I was defeated. Um, it had my emotions all messed up. It really affected my emotional well-being. And because my emotional well-being was affected, um, it affected my physical well-being. It affected my spiritual well-being, and it affected my emotional being. It affected me completely. And then I began having negative emotions. I gave up. I gave up because COVID, I allowed COVID to get the best of me. Um, I was defeated. I couldn't, I couldn't feed my physical well-being. I couldn't feed my emotional well-being. I couldn't feed my spiritual well-being. I couldn't affect my mental well-being. Um, and because of that, I lost sight of my goals to be healthy and happy. And because I lost sight of all those goals, I gained weight. I could feel it in my body. I was getting tired regularly. Um, I was feeling more negative. My clothes got too small and I had to go sizes up. My sugars got a little bit higher as well too. But the one thing I can, I can say is that even though COVID got the best of me, I continued to avoid eating sugary foods. I continued to avoid eating carbs. I wasn't going to let that go. Um, then my sugars got higher than they normally were. Um, when I first started my journey, like I got really good readings for my sugar. I would get always get a reading between four and six. And I got that regularly and consistently. And now my readings are, are anywhere between 6 and 10. They're not the greatest readings right now, but they're not as bad as they used to be. When my sugars, used to check my sugars, I'd be like, when I was 340 pounds, my sugars were like uh, 15, 18, 20. I got my sugars were high like that. And for a good four or five months after, you know, this whole COVID happened and I, I just allowed myself to be inactive and to just get by. I still didn't eat the sugary foods like I said. I said I didn't eat the carbs, but I wasn't on. Fo I wasn't as focused on how much I ate and how often I ate. Before I would make sure you know I ate three meals a day, that sort of thing, and I'd portion it all out. But this time, like during the whole COVID time, I was, I was just eating. I was eating emotionally. I was eating my emotions. Um, and then I finally realized, you know, not long ago, 
beginning of January, I realized, you know, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live to just get by. I don't want to live and let COVID get the best of me. And uh, once the restrictions were eased up, I began my wellness journey again. I got sidetracked, but I got back on. Um, I started going to the gym again. I, I go to the gym regularly. Again, I go like I go every day um, because they opened the gym again. Um, they brought kids back to school and that helped a lot. I began going back to work regularly. Um, I started going to ceremony again because the number of people you can that can gather were, were eased up and I could go to the sweat, I could go to full moon ceremonies, I could go to tie-up ceremonies and that helped feed my spirit. Um, and because these gatherings were lifted, the numbers, I began to see family and friends again. I was able to gather with our, my social circle, things be, got a little bit normal. They're not back to normal yet, but they're getting there. But the one thing I've learned in this whole process is that um, our emotional health directly affects our physical health. It directly affects our spiritual health and our emotional health. We can't treat one separately than the other. They all, they're intertwined and they affect each other. Um, I see these past several months with this whole COVID pandemic as, as stumbling blocks on my path. Something that is challenging, but I will not give up. Like for a while there, I did fall, I fell, and I stayed on the ground for a while, and I felt sorry for myself but I didn't want to stay there. Um, and then January 5th hit, I remember this day, January 5, 2021, was when I finally realized this. And I got up, I dusted myself off, and I continued moving forward. I'm back on track. It'll be another journey before I reach the goals that I, I want to achieve. Um, and I just want to continue moving forward in a good and healthy way. And I hope that you do too. Um, I will not let COVID win. I will not let diabetes win. I will fight till I can't fight no more. Thank you. Tansi, and welcome to the cooking session. And today I have April Osborne with me, health and wellness worker, and she's gonna be co-hosting with me. And today we're doing a cooking session. Today we're gonna be making an oven-baked chicken parmesan, and we're gonna have Caesar salad with it. We have all our ingredients here. What we need today is chicken breast. This is available at the Northern and IGA and the surrounding stores and we also are going to need some marinara sauce some parmesan cheese kosher salt salt and pepper and some panko crumbs bread crumbs these are, can be found at iga you'll also be needing olive oil but if you don't have olive oil you can either use pam this is for the, the pan so that chicken doesn't stick we're also going to need a few eggs and for the spices, we are gonna need garlic powder, oregano, and parsley flakes. And these can be found at their local store. And this is excellent for families and people living with diabetes. We're gonna start off by cutting the chicken in half. And slice it in half, side, sideways like this, so she's doing it. We are going to put it in a saran wrap. We're going to put the saran wrap right on top of the chicken and we're going to smash it down. So if you, if you don't have a pounding hammer, you can use anything. You can even use the, edge of, the end of a, a knife to go like this. 
This is to flatten the, the chicken so that so that it'll cook evenly. You can use anything, even a jar like this. We have a recipe here that only calls for a few chicken, but we're gonna double our recipe so that we can make more and use up all this chicken. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna do our egg mixture with the spices. So we're doubling the recipe, so we're gonna add two eggs. So now we're gonna take two cups of uh, panko breadcrumbs. If you don't have panko breadcrumbs, the regular breadcrumbs will do. Oh, okay. Just put it with the close here. So you need, you're going to need two separate pans. So we're doubling this recipe, so we're going to put two cups of panko breadcrumbs in there. Into the breadcrumbs, we're going to put some spices. So we're going to put one teaspoon dried oregano. So when we're doubling, so that'll be two teaspoons of oregano. Two teaspoons of oregano into the breadcrumb mixture. One, two. Garlic powder, we are going to put it one. It says half a teaspoon, but we're going to add a teaspoon. Okay, so now we're going to add a teaspoon of garlic powder. This is okay. kosher salt, and this can be found at IGA, or at, I think just IGA has it, Family Foods. So we're going to add, because we're doubling the recipe, we're going to put two teaspoons. So this is like salt, except it's more coarse. So that's two teaspoons. One cup of uh, grated Parmesan cheese, fresh. Let's mix it up. So we're going to take this off now. Okay, so now we have the chicken and we need to pat it dry with a paper towel. We're going to season them with some salt and pepper on both sides. Good salt. We preheat it the oven to 400. So those, these are going to be going in right away. We're going to get the pan ready. Uh, on the recipe, it says to put foil on the pan and then uh, oil it with uh, olive oil. But today we're going to use Pam. We're just going to spray the the cooking sheet and we're just gonna gently spray on the pan like so so this is just so the chicken doesn't uh, stick so now we're, we're gonna start our chicken so uh, maybe I'll just mix this a little more with my hand just to make sure that all the spices are mixed in well I'm gonna get April to dip the, the chicken in the egg mixture. This is just beaten eggs. And you're gonna dip it like so. And then she's gonna, and then she's just gonna set it on the pan that I prepared. If you have a lot of chicken, all you do is add more egg and then uh, you can prepare some more uh, breadcrumb mixture. So if you have a large family, you can get a lot of chicken with this uh, six pieces of chicken because you cut it in half and then you'll get 12 pieces mm. out of it.
Perfect. Okay, now we're gonna put it in the oven. We're gonna let it cook. We're gonna be placing it in the middle rack and we're gonna cook it about 10 to 15 minutes on each side. So we're gonna be flipping it over in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so now while we're waiting for our chicken to cook, we're gonna whip up a Caesar salad. And we have here romaine lettuce that you can buy at the, our local stores, as well as Caesar croutons. And they have different flavors of these, so you can buy whatever flavor you like. We also have fresh Parmesan cheese, shredded cheese. And we have here a calorie-wise, low-calorie Caesar uh, dressing. And we're also going to add a little bit of uh, bacon bits. April's going to cut it up and show you how. So what she's doing is she's just cutting, holding it together and cutting it up like so. So you need a big bowl. If you have a small family, you can make a small portion or you can do the whole package if you have a large family. Next, we're going to add in the croutons. Yes. It's a great idea. So if you have uh, some leftover bread, all you have to do is leave them out and let them dry. Cut them up, let them dry. And once they're dried up, you can put them away. Now she's going to add a little bit of bacon bits to give it some nice flavor. This is 100% Parmesan cheese. It comes in packages. Or you can buy the block and shred your own cheese. Or use this kind, the grated orange. That orange. Parmesan. Yeah, you can make your own salad dressing too. Because we're making a big portion, she's added a lot. And we're just going to stir that up. So this uh, Caesar salad, it goes really well with chicken parmesan. So now it's done, and so we'll just uh, cover it up with saran wrap. And then we're just gonna refrigerate it till our chicken is ready. It is recommended that it, for people living with diabetes that if you, you measure a piece of meat with the palm of your hand, then that's the size portion that you should be eating. And so you'd have your vegetables, which is your Caesar salad, and that's a meal, and it's filling. So we'll put this in the fridge and then we're going to check on the chicken. And it's been t only 10 minutes, so we're going to wait another five minutes. But today we're going to make raspberry iced tea, so we bought some fresh raspberries. And you can make a bunch of tea. Like if your children love juice, it's, uh, it's a good idea to start uh, them on uh, low, no sugar uh, drinks. We have real sugar here too. This is for people that don't have diabetes. So if you have diabetes, it's, it's uh, recommended to use Splenda. It's sugar-free. So today's is raspberry iced tea. So the first thing we're gonna do is, we're gonna crush the, uh, we're gonna crush the raspberries. Smells really good. Yes. So now we're gonna divide the raspberries in half for for each of the jugs. So we're gonna just pour it pour it right into the Ooh. 
So now we're gonna stir the the raspberries in the tea. And you notice how the it'll give it a nice raspberry flavor. And if you're using the Splenda, the sugar-free, you can drink as much as you want. What you can either do is take some Splenda and just mix it into the jug, or you can just pour it in a glass. And each person can add in their, their Splenda to their liking. To their liking because this is very sweet I don't know if you know but this uh, artificial sweetener it is actually tastes very sweet so some people might might not like it too sweet so we're just gonna have uh, we're just gonna put half of it and then just stir it up you can add ice okay there's your Raspberry iced tea, homemade raspberry iced tea. Cheers. The chicken's been in the oven for 15 minutes. So we're gonna quickly flip it over. And we'll put it on top of the stove for a bit. And we're gonna we're gonna flip the chicken. And we're gonna let it cook another 15 minutes on the other side. So we're going to throw it back in for another 5-10 minutes and then until it's cooked and then we're going to do the marinara sauce and the cheese topping. Our chicken is uh, ready so we're going to be taking it out but right now you're going to need uh, mozzarella shredded cheese, you're going to need some uh, marinara sauce, marinara sauce and parsley. This is optional. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. So what we're going to do is take out the chicken and we're going to put a quarter cup of marinara sauce on each piece of chicken. We're going to spread it over and then we're going to add some mozzarella on top and a little bit of parsley. And then we throw it back in the oven and we're going to broil it for two minutes, two to four minutes, depending on your stove, until it's nicely browned. <laughs> it does. Spring, sprinkle a little bit of uh, parsley on each of the... So we're just doing a little sprinkle just to give it some nice flavor and a nice, a nice look. So now we're going to throw it back in the oven and we're going to turn it to broil. Chicken is ready, so I'm going to turn the stove off and take out the chicken. Just place it on here. So today on our menu was the oven baked chicken parmesan and our Caesar salad and our homemade raspberry iced tea. This is a healthy lunch for a person living with diabetes or anybody else that doesn't have diabetes. And it's a great meal. Kids love it. It has that like a pizza sauce, it has the cheese, it, and who doesn't love chicken, right? The amount of uh, a person that's living with diabetes should have. So it's also almost a palm size. So this is our cooking session for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'd like to thank April for her assistance. We will be uh, providing the ingredients and the recipe. Enjoy. I would like to say good day to everyone listening to my presentation today. My name is Samantha Falster and my spirit name is Southwind Thunderbird Woman. I would first off I would like to I would like to thank my friend Kim for introducing me to this program, but also to Sheila Dancho who is the founder of the program. 
the Get Healthy program. Today we'll talk about my journey and why I have decided to, to choose this program as a program to help me excel in my health. I guess I could say that I've been on many diets. I've, uh, I've done Atkins, I've tried keto, I've tried all these different diets and for some reason it just like I didn't feel comfortable uh, in those diets until I was introduced to this program and um, I found diets to be uh, like short-term solutions to a long-term solution which was which was my health and being healthy was one of my main goals and when I was introduced to this program what really caught my attention was it focused on insulin insensitivity and there was just no other diet that's ever talked about it and how important it is in our life and in our body. I wonder, what is that? What is insulin insensitivity? What does that mean? So when I think about insulin, you know, I think about diabetes and how people inject insulin to balance their body and balance their sugar. I'm like, okay, well, how does that work? Uh, so the program taught me um, what it was and how it can be balanced. It provided education on insulin insensitivity and brought me to a better understanding as to why people become diabetic and why they have to take insulin. So I really wanted to understand that as, you know, you know, my late father took insulin and I know of some other people who take insulin and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So I was shocked actually when I, when I did learn about it. It was like, yikes. I use a lot of sugar, I eat processed foods, I eat fast foods, I didn't exercise. All these things were racing through my mind when I, when I learned about this program. I felt it was a journey I needed to begin as it gave me insight to what my body goes through when I am not eating right. And most importantly, I wanted to, pre I wanted to prevent diabetes. I needed to take the steps as, you know, as I am older and why wait to become diabetic to change my life. So I wanted to do a prevention of, of that. I guess the best message also was, if you are diabetic, this can change your life also. So when I was able to watch the video and I was able to learn about insulin insensitivity, I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's, that's what I want to learn. That's what I want to do, this program got me to to see and open my eyes as to I want to change I wanted a, I wanted a healthy life and um, I wanted to be focused I wanted to be um, I wanted to exercise you know so it all came with good positive things in my life to my life um, as an indigenous woman we talk a lot about finding balance in our life and the spiritual emotional mental and physical concepts there were times I just felt so tired. I was tired all the time. Um, I felt depressed, I felt down, and sometimes my mind was like foggy. I couldn't think straight. Um, my, the process in the mind wasn't working and functioning as it should have. I'd sit there and it'd be like blank. And so I, there was a lot of symptoms that I had that I wanted to change. Um, at times, um, I knew for a long time that I needed to make change in my life and when, they, when, this in, when this program was introduced to me, I was like, yes, this is what I want to hear, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to feel. And um, I'm here today to, and very grateful to, to be sharing my story with you and my journey because, you know, I want to um, provide you my experience so that, you know, sometimes we talk about things or we feel things and we don't, uh, we feel, are we alone? Do we feel like this by ourselves? And I know there's many that feel the same way as I do. I've had discussions, I've had conversations with other people and, um, and people are ready to change and I know. So I'd like to share with you what this program has done for me and why I made the decision to, cho to choose this program. I first want to talk about insulin insensitivity. 
as this is the core issue that is spoken about in the Get Healthy program. Insulin is your fat storage hormone. So it drives or transports sugar into the cell to be utilized as energy or to be stored as glycogen or fat. So when you eat uh, a food that is high in sugar, your blood sugar goes very high and is very dangerous for your body. So I'm like, okay, I, I kind of knew that when you have a lot of sugar, your body is, you know, reacts to all the sugar. So what happens then the body releases insulin. Insulin takes the sugar out of the blood to take it to the muscle cells first, right? So the insulin, insulin is going to the muscle cells first, but if you haven't exercised in a while, then what happens then is that the, the muscle will not accept it. Then it'll take it to the fat cells and this fat cell will start collecting the insulin. So what happens then is it's in your midsection that you start, in your waistline, you start seeing the fat cells collecting. So this is the process of insulin. When you have too much insulin, so it's like, okay, and this is supposed to be a natural process in your body. So when your body becomes more sensitive to insulin, it makes more insulin. So as blood insulin levels rise, you literally tip over into an abnormal metabolic state, which is insulin resistance. So when I learned about that, I was like, wow, like I can't believe sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm having a chocolate bar and then after that I'm having a hot chocolate and then after that I'm having chips and then I'm having fast food. So it's all these different um, foods that I think about and how my diet used to be and what I needed to change. So there are four different stages that I've learned about uh, with insulin, but the one that you know I, I wanted to discuss today was type two diabetes. What happens is that when the process that, that I just discussed earlier about insulin, that uh, your body continues to stay in that metabolic state. So your all body's always going, 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 trying to um, deal with the insulin, the fat cells, you're gaining weight, you're feeling unhealthy, you're feeling foggy. So those are some of the um, experiences I guess people have had and I've had those experiences and um, it was very uncomfortable. It was scary at times. Um, you know, to this day, you know, I have to fast sometimes for 20 hours. I do different things to try and change the insulin and the process in my body to, to lose weight, but also to feel healthy. When you're in that me metabolic state, your muscle becomes insulin insensitive first. Fat cells are diverted to the fat cells in the abdomen area. So that's when, uh, so when you have high insulin levels in your body, your body stores it as fat. So that's why you'll notice that a lot of men, women have uh, in the midsection, uh, fat, very fat around the, um, the, the core area. As I was, um, as the program was being introduced to me, it was music to my ears to know though that people can get out of that met metabolic state by living a healthy lifestyle with better food intake and low sugar foods. I'm like, okay, I can do that. The Get Healthy program helps reverse that state. It helps provide balance in your body by becoming more sensitive to your insulin and the body naturally releases the fat. It wasn't about how I looked, but more of how I felt emotionally, I guess, and mentally, physically, and spiritually. I wanted to find that balance, and I find that it's helped me in all these areas of my life. And one of the questions, you know, I, you know, during the presentation, I was like, one of the questions, are you insulin resistant? So that was the question. I was like, okay, so what does that mean? So men, if your waistline is 40 inches or more, women 35.5 inches or more. And if you have two of the following, high blood pressure, elevated triglycerides. Elevated triglycerides means, which is the amount of fat in the blood. 
elevated fasting glucose and low HDL cholesterol, which is good cholesterol. So if your, cholesterol, your good cholesterol is low, then it's not fighting off the bad cholesterol. And if your body mass index of 25 or greater, so, you know, you, you have to measure those, those um, <laughs> measure your waist, right? And look at your weight and um, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have all these different areas? And how is it that we can make life better? And that was what um, I focused on and looked at when I was looking at this program. I'm like, hey, I need to really start considering those things. I'm glad I don't have high blood pressure. I'm glad I don't um, have the other, other symptoms, but why wait for them? When I decided to make these changes, um, I didn't want to, I, I've known so many people that are on high blood pressure pills and um, many people who have cardiac issues, fatty liver issues. And so when those things came up in, in the conversation in the, edu in the programming, I was like, yes, these are the things I need to hear. And I hear it all the time in, in our community, in our people, my relatives, my family. So. So some of the health benefits of the Get Healthy program is it lowers your cholesterol, uh, lowers high blood pressure, reduces risk for heart attacks, reduces risks, risk of dementia, reduces risk for sleep apnea, reduces joint pain, reduces risk for cancer, reduces the risk for diabetes, lessens medications, and reduces fatty liver. And um, I have MS, you know, I've, uh, I have multiple sclerosis and it sure has benefited me in many ways with my illness. I have less or literally no symptoms of my illness and it helps me to feel better uh, emotionally. Um, you know, as you know, recently I, I lost um, an important man in my life and that was my father and I find that even during the hard time of uh, grief I'm able to to function better emotionally mentally physically and spiritually because of do because I'm maintaining this program I'm moving forward with this program so I'm able to find that balance I don't know um, if I didn't know about this program where I would be but um, I definitely feel a lot better and I'm making better food choices for myself. I'm sure not perfect yet, but you know, I know that I'll get there. Uh, when I first started the program, I could not believe um, how my body reacted to um, cutting out the sugar in my diet. I, uh, it was like I went into a panic. My body was so used to having sugar used to having all uh, the carbohydrates, all everything that came that was bad for my body, my body, I felt it. And um, it was about two weeks into the program, I was, uh, like during the two weeks, I was feeling it, I was feeling anxious, and my body was reacting like uh, in a way that I've never felt before. And then, it, and then I realized um, that it was an addiction to sugar my body was addicted to sugar and I couldn't believe what it did to my mind and my body when I went through a withdrawal process right and um, how much control sugar had of me and, and my body and my mind right I, I wanted sugar I wanted a chocolate bar uh, my favorite was always pastries I always wanted those I always wanted a cheeseburger I always wanted fries with gravy so there's, these are some of the things that um, I had to cut out of my diet. But in that two weeks, I felt it. I felt um, what sugar does to your body and how it makes you feel when you don't have it. And I came to realize, wow, like I can't believe how um, that, um, that fight I needed to do to, to fight against the addiction of sugar. And uh, 
and it was real it was a real feeling and once you get past that state and realize well I need to make change for myself this is when I'm like it was a really big eye-opener and so well I need to fight for my health and and literally fight for my life I don't um, I think about diabetes all the time and how it's affected you know you know my aunts my uncles my father and um, it was hard it was hard to watch that and I don't think I would want you know my children my grandchildren to watch me go through that process uh, so some of the foods that I had to cut out of my diet was bread rice potatoes pasta candies chips bars pastries just pretty much anything that had gluten in it I, I cut out anything that had sugar in it I cut out um, you know I loved my candies I had to cut those out and the cravings are are very strong sometimes like I said it's like an addiction to sugar right and but it's uh, self-disciplining yourself and telling yourself, no, I want to get healthy. It's a lot of self-talk too. You got to tell yourself, I want change. Because some your mind is a powerful thing, right? It'll do, your mind tells you what your body's going to do. So if you're saying this over and over, then yeah, you'll make that change. So one of the other things that I do with the Get Healthy program, um, having to cut out all those foods I needed to to change my diet and I'm like okay how am I gonna do that and they do provide you with shakes and um, and they also in, provide you with Nutrimeal supplementation so I take two vitamins two minerals and one Biomega in the morning with my breakfast my breakfast consists of a shake that, that's provided to me. There's different kind of shakes. They provide, um, I take whey, the whey shake, and also um, they have vanilla flavored and chocolate flavored. Because chocolate is kind of my weakness, so I love the chocolate shake. Um, so I have my lunch. I have my mid-morning snack, which is a, a low, low sugar snack. Uh, there's certain fruits that you can't eat, like bananas has a lot of sugar in it. Oranges have a lot of sugar in it. Apples. So, um, it's like strawberries, berries, blackberries. Uh, there's different fruits that have less sugar that's good for the mid-morning snack. And sometimes in the mid-morning, everybody's used to having eggs. You can have a boiled egg. Sometimes I'll have a boiled egg or two. Uh, as a mid-morning snack. Lunchtime, um, I would have a shake also. But sometimes I would have a low, uh, low fat, low sugar diet. Uh, snack, uh, lunchtime, I would have a lunch in that area. But sometimes I'd have a, a shake also. Some of the shake, uh, like the whey, for example, I can add berries. I add some, you know, yogurt into my shake. So you're able to add different things, spinach, whatever, whatever you want in that shake. So it's a lot of self-discipline for sure. Then you have your mid-afternoon snack. And then I would do the same thing. It could be vegetables, it could be fruit. It could be any, you have to really be creative in, in creating your snacks and your suppers. Um, I guess for supper, I would have say a chicken breast with a Caesar salad or a tossed salad. Um, because you're so used to having the potatoes or the rice, you're used to having those foods on your plate or a pasta and it's like you have to change change that up for yourself if you really want the change then you'll do it right and you'll notice sometimes in the first while after you eat maybe half an hour 45 minutes after you eat your stomach is growling again and that's just your body telling you i want sugar i want more carbs right so that's what i noticed um being on this program and cutting the sugar out of my diet 
So the nutritional supplements that are provided to me um, give me the optimal levels of micronutrients and improves insulin resistance. I've been taking the supplements since 2019. Uh, vitamins and minerals thrive and generate and repair, right? Repair the body. There are 50 nutrients um, that I take to nourish the body. Bio Omega-3, um, you need to get enough in your body because they work as anti-inflammatory. So when you're eating high processed foods, for example, it causes acid in the body and causes inflammation. So the Bio Omega fights the inflammatory process in your body. You take in the good fats to release the bad fats. So that's what Bio Omega is. So that's kind of a review of what I, I take. And one of the most important other pieces that I decided to do was to exercise. Um, I'm not gonna run 20 miles, I'm not gonna run five miles, you know, it's like, no, that's nothing that I wanna do. I needed to find something that I was comfortable with, that, I, that provided me, um, that I felt content and I felt able to do and that I was happy to do. Like I didn't want to force myself to do exercises that I didn't want to do, right? So uh, I started exercising to develop muscle. I think about the muscle piece and the insulin piece, right? And also how exercises that will help me with, with my weight loss. So what I do is I do it at my own pace. I do yoga every second day, um, if not every day. But I find that yoga builds my strength. And uh, when you're doing yoga, you're doing breathing exercises too. So it provides me a balance with my mental state and also my, the spiritual peace being connected. And um, I really enjoy that. Um, I also bought some snowshoes. Uh, never once did I ever snowshoe in my life, but I uh, live in front of a lake and, you know, made the decision, well, I'm gonna buy these snowshoes and I just love it. I love walking on the lake and um, walking, being amongst nature, I guess. It, it gives me, it helps me feel grounded. It helps me feel connected. And just having that uh, connection to the land, I guess, um, really gives me a peace of mind and it feels really good. I, I really enjoy that. And one of the things that I, remember and always think about too. I did this training uh, back in, I think it was January last year, but this program had taught me that, um, you know, our mind is a very powerful thing. And that when people are overweight, you know, there's always a reason for that. And one of the things that I found about myself was that I was an emotional eater. I um, I ate if I felt sad, I ate if I felt lonely, I ate if I felt depressed. Um, just all the emotions that come, I always ate, you know, it made me feel better. I filled it with that and um, I think it was after that that I realized and I had to identify that myself and that's what people have to realize too, why do I eat like this? Am I an emotional eater? So there's different ways of, um, it's like healing your body, healing your mind, right? And healing your soul. That's what it feels like to me as I do the program. It's not about um, uh, having a beach body or, you know, like all the fads out there right now and how we should look and how society expects us to look. And um, it was about how we feel and that's what was important to me i guess as i went on to the pro when i decided to start the program i wanted to feel good and um that's what it was all about that's what it's all about and um it's about mindful eating you know like i said self-talk you know being able to to convince yourself that it's okay that change is good and I guess after losing my dad too, it was a very difficult time for me. And 
and I'm thankful for this program because it's helped me stay focused and um, it's helped me to think about you know living healthy and um, this program has you know it has changed my life and changed my focus of um, how I want to feel you know I want to feel good I want to feel happy you know I want to be healthy so that um, that is my journey that I shared with you today and um, I do want to be healthy in my life and I want to live a longer life you know and um, if this means that I have to change my diet, I have to change um, my sugar intake, right? And to control my insulin, uh, whether I'm diabetic or not, whether you're diabetic or not, that it, it's, it can happen. I guess one of the other things that I, that I didn't mention was that, because I do have a website. My website is samanthafoster.usana.com. So USANA is spelled U-S-A-N-A. -A. Um, so part of the USANA program, I, I am a consultant for the program. I sell the products. Um, I also can do one-on-one -on -one with uh, individuals if they wanted to. Um, there's many products that are on the website and if you have questions, about anything or would like to get into contact with me, you're more than welcome to to inbox me and um, speak with Myra and she can get connected with me. Um, we do have products for children too. And you know, we want, you know, our children to be healthy. You know, we want to say 20, 30 years down the road that there's no diabetes in our community. You know, we, we need to start with the younger generations and start teaching them about, about health. So I'd just like to take this time to thank you for listening to my journey. And, um, I guess on it. Hi, my name is Audrey Simpson. I am the coordinator for the Strengthening Families Maternal Child Health Program. Joining me is April Osborne, health and wellness worker. My presentation today is on sugar shock, which is a game where April will be guessing how much sugar is in each drink. Um, okay, first of all, I want to share with you what sugar does to the body. So when we digest sugar, enzymes in the small intestines break it down into glucose, sugar, this glucose is then released into the bloodstream where it is transported to tissue cells in our muscles and organs and converted into energy. Beta cells in the pancreas constantly monitor the amount of glucose in the bloodstream and release insulin to control it. This means that if you consume more sugar than your body needs right away, it can be stored for later to keep your blood sugars constant. If your body stops producing any or not enough insulin, or if your cells become resistant to it, this can result in diabetes, leaving your blood sugar levels to rise to dangerously high levels. So if you're looking for how much sugar is in your drink, there's a formula for calculating sugar content. So four grams of sugar is equal to one teaspoon sugar or one sugar cube. Each drink has a label which has your nutrition facts on it and we're going to be looking for sugars. April here is going to be putting how much sugar she thinks are in each beverage. So how many teaspoons of sugar are in your chocolate milk? Seven teaspoons of sugar and your sunny D. Six teaspoons and then your Gatorade. Four teaspoons and then your Diet Coke, Coca Cola. 
one teaspoon your apple juice, bouncy sugar, six, eight teaspoons of sugar. How many teaspoons are in your king can, you think? Guess. Six teaspoons and your Red Bull. Red Bull energy. Red Bull energy drink. Six and your orange crush. How many sugars a teaspoon? Five teaspoons. Your water? Nothing. No water. I mean no sugar in your water. Kool-Aid jammers. Four. So there's four teaspoons you picked. So now we're going to calculate the amount of sugar. So we'll look on your nutrition facts. See, it says here, mm -hmm. carbohydrates, and you look sugars, there's 52 grams. So 52 grams into four will give you 13 teaspoons of sugar so sunny d there's 12 grams of sugar so that'll give you three teaspoons of sugar and our gatorade has 42 grams of sugar so that 11 teaspoons we're gonna round it off because actually it's 10.5. So we'll round it up to give you 11 teaspoons of sugar. This has zero, because it's a diet drink. There's no, no, no sugar, sugar. And your apple juice has 43 grams of sugar. That gives you 11 teaspoons of sugar in this. And then Pepsi, this King can has 55 grams of sugar and it'll give you 13.75 so 14 teaspoons of sugar and your Red Bull has 27 grams of sugar which gives you 7 6.75 but it's 7 rounding off and then your Orange Crush, you said six teaspoons of sugar, but there is actually a total, it says 71 grams of sugar on your nutrition facts here in the back. So it is 17.75, well we put 18 teaspoons of sugar. Water zero and your Kool-Aid jammers, there is only two teaspoons of sugar. It says there is eight grams Four is two. So when we look at all the sugar we're intaking um, for ourselves or for our children, um, the best thing we would drink would be water. So your best choice of beverage would be water or real limit your drink intake and thank you for your time. So next on our agenda, I'd like to welcome Liet Laffer. She is a Norhouse Cree Nation member and she will be sharing her journey living with diabetes. My name is Liette Laffer. I am from the Norway House Cree Nation and I work for Kuwait and Tribal Council here in Thompson as a wellness worker. I was diagnosed with diabetes. I was told in 1995 that I had it, but the physician actually had said that based on the symptoms that I had had, that he thinks that I probably had diabetes years before that and diabetes also runs in my family. I was diagnosed immediately as having type 2 diabetes. In 1994, 
I was diagnosed with prediabetes. I was officially told in 1995 that I had diabetes and immediately I was put on a number of different kind of medication. The first medication I was put on was metformin. Um, that wasn't, I wasn't taking to the medication so immediately they put me on insulin. So for about 25 years I had diabetes. Um, my mom and dad both were diagnosed with diabetes relatively early in their life. Um, I am the youngest of five and I was the first one out of all my siblings to be diagnosed with diabetes and some of my siblings do have it. I had a lot of the symptoms. Um, I remember one day I was incredibly thirsty. I remember feeling very dizzy, feeling very faintish. Um, and then I actually had gone to eMERGE here in Thompson. And what I did do was I did the test and they told me that my glucose reading was quite high. And then they told me that I had diabetes. The feeling for me having diabetes, I think that my body had just become adjusted to the norm, I guess, of, of having it, having the chronically high sugars. When I was first diagnosed with diabetes, immediately I was in shock. I was, I felt completely devastated. And I remember asking the physician as he's writing a prescription out for me, I said, well, what do I do now? Like how, why did I get this? And he immediately said that I was predisposed to getting it because I was First Nation and that genetically, you know, this family members had it and this was something that just ran in my family. In 2017, um, I had a scare. I remember I was working for the Northern Regional Health Authority at the time. Um, I was actually a CPR instructor and I worked for this program called Organization and Staff Development. I remember the Thursday morning in January, I was incredibly tired. I couldn't explain the fatigue. I had just come back from holiday, from my winter holiday. And I remember walking down the hall, going to my office and all of a sudden, I couldn't hear my friends speaking to me. I started to sweat. I knew that I wasn't getting oxygen, but I couldn't explain what was happening to me. I went upstairs and I called my good friend who worked in Emerge and I said, hey, I'm presenting something and I'm wondering if I can come and get a glucose reading because I think it's my diabetes. By the time I got to Emerge, they took me in right away and my heart rate was at 23. Um, I was immediately taken into a room to have an EKG done. And basically what was happening is, like I was basically getting ready to go into cardiac arrest. I had in total six episodes of third degree block. Um, ultimately what had happened to me was I had to get a pacemaker. So I recall being in Winnipeg, waiting for the pacemaker, and I just pieced together everything that had happened in my life in terms of, you know, my health, um, not caring for myself, having the diabetes, um, indulging, not exercising properly, and just neglecting myself during this, this time. And, in 2017 is when I made the decision to start taking my life back, to start figuring out what it was I needed to do to get well. And I recall I had gone to see my physician and again, wanting to see if we could try a new course of medication or if I could increase the current medication I was on. And I sat there trying to brainstorm a game plan for myself and I recall my doctor looked at me and he had said, do you wanna know what will fix all of this? And I said, yeah, like, tell me what is it? He said, lose weight. 
And I recall thinking, oh, that's simple. Like, that's, that's okay. Like, this, I can do this. For two years, I struggled. I often struggled with diets. I struggled um, maintaining a diet and not indulging in, in treats. Um, even having the diabetes, there were moments in my life where I just ate whatever I felt, um, not factoring in that I had diabetes and I needed to consider that. When I started seeing the rewards and the benefits of incorporating a balanced meal, nutritional meal, just with in combination of exercise and commitment, I started noticing the transformation, not only physically, but also spiritually. Um, I recall losing the first 10 pounds and being so incredibly grateful. And I noticed my sugar started decreasing. I, I was at a point in my life where I had completely exhausted all my options in terms of medication, quick fixes, and I knew ultimately that I needed to incorporate exercise into, into my new world. I remember walking outside, walking for three minutes and feeling incredible pain. Um, I didn't give up. I continued every day. Um, it is. It was very painful walking. Anything when you when you are walking cement is very very painful. I would walk bush trails. I got a treadmill and I started walking on the treadmill. Once I noticed that the weight was coming off in combination with a really healthy diet, I totally eliminated rice flour, refined sugars, everything that I knew. Um, I stopped drinking pop. I stopped eating chips. The temptation was always there. I totally changed how I looked at food and what my relationship was like with food. I was an emotional eater. I indulged in everything that I could. I needed to re-establish my relationship with food on a healthier level in terms of eating that balanced diet, eating portion sizes, learning to have smaller meals throughout the day. As I started going to my physician regularly, I noticed there was a decrease in medication. My A1C, when I would go get blood work done, you know, started to decrease, decrease, decrease in combination with the weight loss. He, I remember he said to me, whatever I'm doing to continue doing what I'm doing. Um, I got a lot of support in this community when I started my crusade of my weight loss. Everybody would be commenting, saying they seen me walking, they were proud of me. I remember people blowing their horns and I remember feeling so motivated and inspired and you have those good feelings you want to continue because people are seeing the rewards of the weight loss i remember when i went in to see my doctor after i dropped about 150 pounds it was amazing because i, I was still taking the insulin but it was decreased my my insulin started to decrease and i recall he said to me that I needed to stop taking the insulin. And I remember looking at him and I couldn't believe this. He actually wanted my insulin pen. He wanted me to surrender my pen to him. And this was something that I carried in my purse for 25 years. It was, it was like carrying chapstick in, in your purse. And I remember thinking, this was all that I knew. And after the A1C, he reviewed the A1C with me. He essentially had said it was as if I never had diabetes and I was normal. I had not even heard that in, in 25 years. I didn't even know what normal was.
welcome back. Uh, so next on our agenda, we're going to have uh, Leslie McKay back. Um, he's going to do some more exercises with us, and we, I'd like you to join him because we've been sitting so long and uh, enjoying the presentations. I'd like to get the body flowing again. So if you could join him in the exercises. Hey guys, me again, Leslie. Uh, as we're approaching this, our last second lap of the conference, I'm gonna go through another exercise. You know, just get up normally up your chair and just walk, stationary walk. Get your legs flowing, your blood flowing in your legs. Okay, do that a few times. We're gonna stretch our arms. Just put your right arm over your left shoulder. Hold that for about three to five seconds. Second arm. Three to five seconds. You want to go over our head? Just get your left hand, reach for your right elbow, and just pull behind your head. Three to five seconds. Getting your arm. Should be good to go. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the presentations. So next on our agenda is the health and wellness team. They will be performing skits on family life that could potentially lead to family member or family members heading towards a life living with diabetes. The scenario is about a family living an unhealthy lifestyle and experiencing health problems, leading them to make changes together as a family by making healthy food choices and being more physically active. Please welcome the Community Health and Wellness Team. participating in class and you're distancing yourself from the kids. Is there a reason for that? This is your lunch. This is what you bring to school every day. Chips. This is what you do the tax for you. Is that why you don't sit at home and talk with the students? Talk to your parents that they need to provide a healthy lunch for you. Thanks for letting me know, Elsie. Did you watch the news last night? No, what? This virus thing that's going on. No. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they can get the vaccine out soon so we can get back to normal to what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. You know, lately uh, I haven't been feeling better. You know, there's times when I'm so thirsty and uh, tired. Yeah, for I no noticed reason. that. I noticed that lately. And uh, I've been going to the washroom lots. I noticed that too. Uh, yeah. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know. Well, you know you've been drinking lots of coffee all the time. Maybe you should cut back, you know, when you're eating. But I think you should go to the clinic. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, it's probably nothing. You know. yeah. I'm not a doctor, but I think you should go to the yeah. clinic. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, so okay, something yeah. something happens. Ah, uh, we'll see what it is. See what's going on. You no. Know? But I love my Tims. <laughs> That's for sure. I don't sure. know if I can gift that one up. Uh, and your cigarettes and your uh, Timmies and your eating habits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah, I think maybe you should go see the doctor. Yeah, okay. I'll do Sounds that. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's in the room, honey. What you want? Oh, oh, oh. You should hold the room here. I can't see the screen. What you want? Oh, oh. My turn, too. Oh, she says he's in the room. Counselor, my name is Mrs. Hoffman, and I'd like to talk to you guys about your daughter Elsie. What did Elsie do now? I'm concerned about um, her lunch. Okay. What's, what's wrong with her lunch? She's taking chips, Pepsi, and noodles, and they're unhealthy for her. Oh, well, chips are good. No, they're not, Mr. Moore. What do you guys feed her here? Well, food. What kind of food do you feed her? We give our kids like, they like eating chicken nuggets. You know, they eat that all the time because sometimes we run late and they throw the food in the oven themselves. And sometimes if I don't want to cook, I get KFC. You're feeding your kids processed food. And then I know they love the Timmy's. My husband drinks Timmy's all the time. And then sometimes too, we we're eating supper. Supper times we like eating bologna and mashed potatoes with corn. Canned mm. corn. I think the concerns I have is your daughter's isolating herself from the other students. Well, you know, me and my husband were talking and he just got back from the clinic a couple of days ago and we were talking with Elsie and when my husband was saying that he seen the doctor and that's where we were talking about what the doctor said to him. What's going on there? Going on with you, Mr. Moore? Well, apparently I have diabetes. How do you feel about that now? I... I'm still having doubts about it. You're still having doubts? I never... I don't think I have diabetes, but that's what the doctor says. Maybe it's best that you follow what the doctor had told you to do. Like you need to, you need to make your lifestyle, change your eating habits better for Elsie too. Yes, I noticed in her class too that she's falling behind and after knowing that she's not eating healthy and that she has, uh, her behavioral is very bad. So I'm thinking it's because that she found out there, she's taking the news at her, about her dad. Elsie wants some nutritious food like her friends at school. And she's very worried about her dad's eating habits. I and guess her. I can say it's my fault too because I, I don't know what to cook and that's all I'm cooking to it at lunchtime when the kids come home for lunch and they like eating their hot dogs and fries right away. And then if they get a treat, they always eat their candy bars. 
and everything else. So that's what, um, it's easy and fast, I'll say. That's why I cook like that. And I can't get them off this stuff here. They like it so much. So, the corned beef hash. Um, Sarah, I know what you mind. I was wondering if it'd be all right if I can send one of the elders here to come and talk to you guys about healthy eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I would like my family to know, to know and to start to eat healthy since so that my husband is uh, diagnosed with it has to be a life changing life changing so I know that um, he won't be able to have any more of this anymore <laughs> we better cut down because it's lots of sugars in there too and it's like to take the edge off but Mr. Moore, are you ready to make life changes for the better? Well, if it's affecting my children, I think it would be best to try and make changes so in the way I do things. Time to lay off the sauce because it's not good for your diabetes. And your cigarette smoking too. I see you have cigarettes here too. Oh, I smoke about a pack and a half a day. That's gonna kill you. Too much cigarettes. Mm -hmm. That's a pack and a half. <laughs> so I'll send the elder to come and meet with you in a couple of, maybe a day or two. Is that all right, both of you? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Hello. My name is Sarah, my elder. I'm supposed to come and talk to you and your family. Uh, the school counselor sent me here. So where's your, your children? Kids, come down here. Come and listen. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. The school counselor sent me here because of uh, your behaviors <laughs> on how you eat. A lot of junk food, the mother feeding the, the kids with a lot of junk food. And your husband is a diabetic and smoking and having coffee, right? So I'm going to tell you a story our elders used to eat. Right? Is that how I'm supposed to be? Well, uh, the food I'm eating right now is, is what it's what she's cooking, eh? So uh, you got no choice to but to eat it. Yeah, I'm not shoving it down your throat. <laughs> and you have to learn how to cook the food, right? Well, yeah, to cook healthy okay. because I see that you're feeding your kids chips and uh, it's um, hard it's hard it's hard to do stuff like that but that's what uh, i can find at the store well see sometimes uh you have to learn maybe talk to somebody a diabetic uh, counselor and they'll teach you why tim that's who's, who's diabetic well if you want to help your husband you have to got down a lot of stuff, right? And with your kids, the way they behave, mm. you know, they, you're feeding them with a lot of sugar and all that. And then it's in that gene, right? They can be become a diabetic too. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Changes. Yeah. Long time ago, our people, us native people, right? Our native people used to eat wild food. They used to go out and men go out hunting. They'll bring the moose, beaver, rabbits, all kind of food, the fish. So there was no such thing as a diabetic. Nobody was worried about a diabetic. They didn't, you know, they just, they were so active. And how our grandmothers, how they used to cook the food, how they saved the food, you know, it was so healthy. Our, ancestors were so healthy and the children they were so active they had to go out 
they have sight or help their parents cutting wood, carrying water, going in a bush, going near rapids. You know, that family was so active a long time ago. When a white man came to our community, they started introducing us to the food. How they fries and all that food and we become so unhealthy. Our children, all they do is, uh, well, I've seen your children playing games and sitting there and eating all these munchies, right? Long time ago, people didn't have those kind of stuff. Young children used to go and pick berries. Those are the, our grandmothers used to feed us kids the berries, strawberries, raspberries. So we had to eat healthy. And you know, <clears throat> there was no such thing as a bottle drink, so you guys have there. We had to, you know, drink water, because water is the one that keep us healthy. So we have to remember, yes, there's a lot of change in our lives, but you have to balance of how much you eat, how much you feed your kids. Take the games away from them. Do family things. Go camping. Go snow sewing. So your husband can become healthy. And you can become healthy. And your children can become healthy. So with that, you know, you need to keep continuing to see the, seek that help. And it's only you that can make the changes. You can hear that, children? So you're going to have to help us here. <laughs> Come in. Good afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. Moore. Good afternoon. Doing a follow-up. I see Elsie is bringing healthy foods to class. Yes, she is. She's enjoying her food. We started cooking with each other. I see you made changes to your diet, Mr. Moore. Oh, I had to. It was kind of hard at first, but uh, you know, I had to adapt to it. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I see Junior is exercising now. I don't see video games and. Nancy's sweeping the floor, being active. Yeah. Have you been doing that? Anything active, Mr. Moore? Oh, yes, me and uh, Junior went uh, said rabbit snares uh, a couple of days ago. So hopefully we'll be eating rabbits soon. And uh, in the coming days, we're planning to go set a net so we can get some fish on the table. That's so nice to hear that mm -hmm. you're doing activities with Junior and your uh, children. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mrs. Moore, how? Um, I started to uh, look at the labels on the on what I'm cooking and starting to look for recipes and uh, to get all my daughters and children into uh, helping out cooking, so we'll know what's good to eat. So, Elsie, how have you been doing? I noticed that you're starting hanging around with other kids at school. That's nice to see. So I'll report back and um, to the elder that you guys made changes. And I want to take this time to say thank you for making changes for a better lifestyle for your children. Mm. So next on our agenda, we will be viewing Self-Care in Norway House, a video presentation by Albert Apatagan, Mental Health Coordinator for Norway House Cree Nation. Please enjoy.
But everybody's got a choice to make Everybody needs a leap of faith When are you taking yours? What are you waiting for? Well, we are coming to a close at our fourth annual ADI Diabetes Conference. It has certainly been a heartfelt experience for me. You know, as I listen to the testimonies of our own people sharing their personal journeys living with diabetes, I'm sure it has touched you. The purpose of this year's conference was to share with you the impacts the serious disease can have on one. I have learned that each of them had their own unique experiences but all have encountered struggles in all aspects of health, not only physically, but as well as mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, this tells us the importance of maintaining a balance in all aspects of health to maintain wellness in our being, our health and life. These wonderful people that have shared their journeys were willingly and wanting to share themselves because they have love and care to all of you and especially to the young and the children and the adolescents. They have shown us the hardships and struggles they are continually having on a daily basis living with diabetes, not to mention other daily struggles one encounters in life. Throughout the conference, we have heard several messages and it might have hit home for most of us. I am honored and humbled to have witnessed and to hear firsthand personal journeys living with diabetes, as it has opened my eyes to many things. I have learned so much from each of the speakers throughout the conference. Our health matters, we all matter. Each and every one of us matter from the day we were born right to the end of our journey on earth. You know, uncontrolled diabetes can hurt us and damage our body, our being. You know, when one experiences this, not only does it affect the person living with it, the effects have a ripple effect onto the family, extended family and to the community. We are all affected by diabetes type two. We have all heard firsthand of what one goes through living with diabetes type 2. We saw and heard the struggles each had to maintain to control their blood sugar levels, the damaging effects of uncontrolled blood sugars. The message I heard from the personal testimonies is that type 2 diabetes is hard to live with, but it can also be managed. It, can also, it is also preventable and diabetes can also be reversed. A very strong message that we, as each individual, we can all do something to prevent it. We all have the power and the God-given gift, our mind, to make personal choices and decisions to be healthy. To make healthy choices of eating and to be physically active. Physical activity is another God-given gift don't take your mobility for granted. We need to keep moving, to move so we can keep circulating our blood, our body. It needs to keep moving to stay healthy. We also need to move to burn off that extra stored fat we carry. Let's eat to live, not live to eat. Let's control diabetes and not allow it to control us. Always remember you are in control of your health and diabetes is preventable. The, the responsibility is ours and our children are our responsibility. 
In my opening remarks, as I talked about technology and how it keeps us still. I'm not knocking technology, no. Because technology can be a good thing, but like anything else, it needs to be done in moderation. Technology can be used to benefit us. A component of diabetes management and prevention is diabetes education. Utilize the technology to learn all you can about diabetes, whether you are living with it or not. Utilize it for physical activity. There are research ways to keep you moving. Don't think of physical activity as a chore. Make it fun. Google fun activities and enjoy them with a the whole family. I know lifestyle changes are easier said than done. We all face daily challenges. You know, there are curve balls thrown at us all the time. Whether they are financial, food availability, the desires for good tasting foods, the pandemic, the healthcare systems, and they're being affected, and so on. But we can start by making small changes to live healthier. You know, for example, cutting out junk food, processed foods, going for daily walks. Small changes can lead to bigger changes. Let's start at home. Teach your children at an early age. Drink water each, at each meal. Water is the life giver. Let's not defeat ourselves thinking of the worst and saying, I can't do this. We can do this. Our nation is in Inuaka are the most resilient people. We can achieve good health. Include self-care. Love yourself. You are important. Treat yourself as such. Maintain a healthy balance. Feed your mind, your soul, your spirit, your body with good things to help you. So now in closing, I want to express my sincere gratitude to all the wonderful people that have helped me to put this important conference together. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the individuals that have shared their personal journeys. Amazing, good-hearted people. You have made this conference possible. It has been definitely an honor that you have shared from the goodness of your heart and give us, giving us a glimpse of your life. And, and with that, I am so sincerely thankful. Thank you so much. I want to make special mention to one of our guest speakers, Liette Laffer, a Norehouse Cree Nation member. She presently lives in Thompson. She did an amazing job to pre-record her journey and email it to us as she could not be here to join us in person. Thank you to her. And it shows the commitment and love she has for her community and her people to go out of her way to do that. Thank you, Liette. Thank you to all the Norhouse Cree Nation health and wellness team for their entertainment and wonderful acting. They have shown us and reminded us of our bad habits and unhealthy lifestyle that can lead to diabetes. You know, they also taught us that unhealthy lifestyle can be changed. It is up to us and we need to start at home as a family unit. Thank you for showing us that. I'd like to thank Chief Larson Anderson and Council and our Health Director Florence Duncan for their continuous support to the ADI program and supporting me in what I do for, the, for program service delivery during these uncertain times. Thank you so much. Thank you to Reverend Olive Lett and to Reverend Lawrence Moore for their kind words and their prayers. I especially want to thank all of you who took part and the time to participate by watching and learning throughout the conference as we aired it. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our conference sponsors, the Northwest Company, Roswell and Bayfort, uh, KSBDC, KSMA and the Health Division. Thank you. Special thank you to our cameraman and his assistant, Austin Apatagan and Sharon Elmino. Thank you to Austin for being patient with me and for your amazing work. Thank you, Austin. Thank you to the manager of the Norhouse Communications, CGNC, Clayton Doust, also known as SPEC. It is with his blessing and his team to make it possible to air the conference to the comfort of your own home. Egusani. Once again, thank you to everyone and a special mention to my assistant Audrey with her Sugar Shock presentation and helping me do all the work behind the scenes and preparing to put the conference together. 
I also want to thank April Osborne, who assisted me with the cooking session. Thank you, girls. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you. Egusani, kinanasko mitnaoka kinakagi penta tawiyak, nakamantu kawi so enemigwao. Egusani. All right, we'll do a closing prayer for the diabetes conference that has happened. In the words of the living God, right from the beginning of the creation story, Genesis chapter 124. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb, healing seed, vegetable, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which it is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. This diet was not only the fairy diet that God, the creator of man, in his infinite wisdom, knew would be that would pro pro properly nourish and sustain physical human life on earth. God also knew it was a very diet that would enable an innate self healing to prevent his human creation from becoming sick. In Genesis chapter 31 we read, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. From the beginning, sickness was not part of God's plan or his human creation, for his human creation. How do we know that? Because God said that everything he had created was very good in Genesis chapter 131. Consider what the Bible says in 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul, thy soul shall prosper. Okay, we'll do a closing prayer, a prayer for healing for diabetes. Our Father, we thank you for your salvation, the greatest miracle of all. Thank you for your eternal love and unmentored grace. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to break the power of the devil and to bring us hope, health, and healing. Lord, you are good, and your unveiling love endures forever. You are great, and you perform wonder wonderful deeds. You alone are God. How great are, are your signs, and how powerful are your wonders. Lord, you are high above all. The Holy Spirit help persons with diabetes, not the ill to temptation, but deliver them from the evil one. Lord, you are the Almighty. Only you can open the eyes of the blind and unpluck the ears of the deaf. You cause the lame to leap like a deer. And those who cannot speak, sing for joy. You cause springs to gush forth in the wilderness and streams to water the wasteland. You cause the parched ground to become a pool of springs of water to satisfy the thirsty land. Great and awesome is your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless us all.